The power that radiated from the stranger was bloody glorious. It was all glowy and angelic-like, and what he was offering was tempting. But still, there was something a little bit off. It is little enough to ask for what he offers us. Such power, and he speaks the truth. What he shows us will come to pass. But the third leader of the Eridar, Velen, wasn't quite so sure. There was something about this Sargeras bloke that gave him the goosey boots. The fact that Kil Jaden, who Velen was quite close with, was inclined to accept the offer was perhaps enough to sway Velen's opinion, but he didn't give a shit what Archimon thought. Velen then thought about the image Sargeras had shown them, worlds for them to conquer, but more importantly, to explore and investigate. The Eridar were a curious bunch. They bloody loved knowledge, and all Sargeras asked for in return for a buttload of knowledge was loyalty. As usual, our Velen is the cautious one. Yeah, and sometimes my caution has saved us as much as your instinctive impulsiveness. Both Kil'jaeden and Archimonde laughed at that, and for a moment, Velen was warmed by their affection. But then it went quiet, and Velen's heart sank once more as he realised his two colleagues had already made up their minds. Velen knew that they only wanted what was best for the Eridar, and he shared that sentiment. But there was seriously just something about Sargeras that made him feel weird and dirty. Velen approached the temple, a place he often went when he was troubled and stuff, and there, in all its glory, was the Atamal Crystal. It was an artifact so ancient that nobody could remember where the bloody hell it came from, but legend had it that it was bestowed upon them long ago as a gift. It had helped to expand the Eridar's mental abilities, plus it could be used for healing, conjuration, and visions, which was what Velen was hoping to use it for tonight. So, he touched the crystal gently, allowed the familiar power to penetrate him, and closed his eyes. At first, the vision he saw only seemed to confirm what Sargeras had promised. Knowledge, coming out their ears. It was great, but as he turned to look at Kil'jaeden and Archimonde, and caught a glimpse of himself, he cried out in horror. Their bodies were now massive, twisted, and distorted. Light radiated from them, but not the pure light of positive, powerful energy. It was a sickly green, Minari. The others arrived almost immediately. Velen had sent out a mental plea, and shared his vision with them. This is not a glimpse into the future that we can verify. It is only your hunch. Archimond is right. There is no veracity here. Only an image in your own mind. Balls. Velen then gently detached his thoughts from theirs, which Kil'jaeden took as surrender and placed a hand on his friend's shoulder. I do not want to give up what I know to be positive and good and true for what I fear might be unpleasant. Nor I think to you. Velen couldn't risk lying. Kil'jaeden and Archimond would see right through it. So he just looked down, sighed, and nodded. He knew with terrifying certainty that his friends were now destined to become Minari, something horrifically wrong. And if they knew he was no longer with them, they would turn on him with deadly consequences. A short time later, Velen had returned to the temple and was once again staring at the Atomal Crystal, desperate for an escape plan. There was nowhere on this world to hide from a being like Sargeras, so what the bloody hell was he supposed to do? However, as if by magic, the crystal then started to glow and rise slowly from its pedestal. Touch it. What? Touch it. So Velen reached out and did what he was told. Ooh. Energy then raced through him. It was intense, almost as powerful as the sickly green energy he'd witnessed in his vision. But this was pure, and Velen suddenly felt hope and strength deep inside him. You are not alone, Velen of the Eridar. We too have sensed the impending horrors about to befall this and other worlds. We strive to keep the balance and what Sargeras is planning will rip everything apart. Utter chaos and ruination will descend, and the things that are good and true and pure and holy will be lost beyond recovery. What are you? We are the Naru. You may call me Kure. This is where it all begins. We cannot stop it, for your friends have free will, but you have reached out with an anguished heart to save what you can, and therefore we will do what we can. We will save those of you whose hearts reject the horror of what Sargeras offers. What do you need me to do? Gather those who will listen to your wisdom. Go to the highest mountain in the land on the longest day of the year. Take the Atamal crystal with you. It is how we will find you again. We will come down and bear you away. For a moment, there was a flicker of doubt in Velen's heart. He'd never even heard of Anaru, and now this one was telling him to steal his people's most sacred object and bugger off up a mountain with it and it seemed to be implying that it was they who had given it to the Eridar in the first place, which was just outrageous. Perhaps Kil'jaeden and Archimonde were right. Perhaps these visions were nothing more than Velen's fear, manifesting itself. Nah, 
These doubts were just him desperately clinging on to the idea that everything could go back to the way it was. That everything wasn't about to change horribly. The first ally that Velum was able to summon was Taugath, an old dear friend. All rested upon this friend, because he'd be able to move unwatched where Velen could not. Taugath had been a little bit sceptical at first, but once Velen connected their minds and stuff, he quickly agreed. However, Velen didn't bother mentioning the Naru or their plan. He simply assured Taugath that there was a way to escape. And as the longest day of the year drew closer, Velen used his discretion to send out further tendrils of thought to those he trusted. However, when at last the day came, and those that had chosen to follow Velen started to assemble atop the tallest mountain of their ancient world, Velen saw that there really weren't that many of them at all. Not everyone had arrived yet, Taugath for example, but there were only a few hundred here, and that number probably wasn't going to increase drastically, so that was a bit upsetting. Taugath and several others then cleared a rise in the distance, smiling and waving, and for a moment Velen sighed in relief, but as he started down to meet them, the Atamal Crystal sent out a powerful surge of energy through his body, and the old Eridar dropped to his knees. His mind then opened to its warning, and he realised that the new arrivals in the distance were not friendlies at all. They were disguised somehow, but the crystal now revealed that they were in fact Minari, Talgath included. As the Minari scrambled up the mountain, closer and closer, Velen, out of desperation, gripped the Atamal Crystal and thrust it upward to the sky. And that worked somehow. A pure shaft of radiant light appeared, its glory shone directly into the crystalline prism, splintered into seven distinct rays, and the crystal itself bloody exploded. Velen gasped, but the fractured pieces remained animated, shot upward, joined together to form a spinny circle, and created an enclosure of light around the gathered Eridar below. A deep thrumming sound then descended from above, and as Velen looked upward, he saw what looked like a star. Twas glorious. I am here, as I promised I would be. Prepare to abandon this world, Prophet Velen. Velen and the rest of the gathered Eridar then began to float upwards, towards the star, and upon closer inspection, Velen realised it was some kind of vessel. The base of the ship then started to open, and the next thing the escaping Eridar knew, they were inside it. But down below, Kil'jaeden watched as the peculiar vessel in the sky shimmered, and then disappeared. Curses! What was that thing that came down and snatched Velen from their grasp? Sargeras will not be pleased. What now? We find them, and destroy them even if it takes a thousand years. My name is Thrall. The word means slave in the human tongue, but the story behind that name is a long one, and best left for another time. By the grace of the spirits and the blood of heroes before me that runs in my veins, I have become war chief of my people, the Orcs, and the leader of a group of races known as the Horde. Slow down, mate. I can't ride that quickly. Sorry. Um, this is the story of my father and those who believed in him. Of those who betrayed him, this is the tale not of the Horde as it exists today, but of the rise of the very first Horde. Its birth, like that of any infant, was marked by blood and pain. Its harsh cries for life meant death to its enemies. Wow, you're really going for it with all these metaphors and shit. For such a grim and violent tale, it begins peacefully enough, amid the rolling hills and valleys of a verdant land called Drenel. Duritan, of the Frostwolf clan, was wide awake. The others were all snoring and dreaming, but Duritan couldn't get to sleep at all. He could hear the drums, feel the vibrations travelling up through the earth. He longed to go out and join the adults, but there would be another summer before he'd be allowed to participate in the Omrigor, the rite of adulthood. Until then, he just had to accept being in the child's tent. Orcs weren't a particularly sociable people. Each clan kept to itself, had its own traditions, there were even variations of dialect that differed so much that some orcs could barely understand each other. They seemed almost as different to one another as the other sentient race that shared this world. But twice a year, spring and autumn, the orc lands came together, to one of that time when day and night were the same length. The Koshag Festival, always held in the land the orcs called Nagrand, which meant Land of the Winds, in the shadow of the sacred mountain called Oshagoon, which meant Mountain of Spirits. 
The first night of Koshag festivities were pretty straightforward. Cheer at the moon for a bit, then have a big feast. The children, Juritan included, had been permitted to stay up until they'd eaten their fill. But it was bedtime as soon as the shaman departed to climb Oshagoon. The mountain wasn't like other mountains. It wasn't irregular and rough in its shape. It was precise and sharp, like a spearhead. It looked like a giant crystal. Some legends told that it had fallen from the sky hundreds of years ago. But as interesting as the mountain was, Juritan had always thought it was a bit unfair that the shaman had to stay there for the entirety of the festival. They missed all the fun, just like the children. Juritan sat up. He couldn't take this anymore. So he got to his feet and moved slowly towards the tent entrance. Until eventually, he passed through the flap and immediately found himself face to face with another young orc. What are you doing? What are you doing? Same thing as you, I guess. We can either keep talking about it or do it. All right then, let's do it. So the two young orcs stepped out into the frosty night to begin their mischief. They were pretty visible out in the open, illuminated by the moon's glow, so they quickly head towards a large tree that would give them a bit of cover from adult eyes. I am Orgrim, line of Telkar Doomhammer, of the Blackrock Clan. I'm Juritan, line of Garad, Frostwolf Clan. The two young orcs then spent the next minute or so nodding approvingly at each other. Not to blow their own trumpets or anything, but they were both from pretty impressive clans. They then peered carefully around the tree and strained to listen, and over the crackling sound of a huge bonfire, they heard some voices, including that of Juritan's dad. The shaman have been kept busy this year with the fever. As soon as one of the younglings gets cured, another falls ill. It's been harsh with the animals too. When we were preparing for the festival, we had a hard time finding any cleft hooves. Klaga makes a delicious soup from the bones, but she refuses to tell us what herbs she uses. The only one who'll get that recipe is the little one when she comes of age. Both Juritan and Orgrim's jaws dropped. This was what was so important, so secret that children were forbidden to be a part of it. Discussions of fevers and soups. What a load of old shit. Pretty sure you and I can come up with something a little bit more interesting than this. The festival went on for another two days, and during that time, Juritan and Orgrim regularly found ways to sneak away and challenge each other to all sorts of contests. Racing, climbing, feats of strength, and each defeated the other almost as if they planned on taking turns. So at the end of the festival, Orgrim called for a final challenge to break the stalemate. Let's not perform some common ordinary challenge. Let's do something truly different in the history of our people. What do you suggest? Let's be friends, you and I. Friends? But we're not even of the same clan. We're not enemies. Look around you. The clans come together twice a year and there's no harm in it. Yeah, but my father says it's precisely because we come together so seldom that peace is kept. Very well. I thought you were braver than the others, Orgrim of the Doomhammer line, but I guess I was wrong. Timid, shy, and unwilling to see beyond what has always been done. I'm no coward. I back down from no challenge, you upstart Frostwolf. Orgrim then sprang on Juritan, knocking the smaller orc off his feet, and the two had a bit of a wrestle, right up until a shaman appeared out of nowhere. Impetuous boy! It was the head shaman of the Frostwolves, a very old female they called Mother Kashur. You are not too old for a clip around the ears, young Juritan. Another shaman, presumably from the Blackrock clan, appeared and muttered similar displeased sounds at Orgrim. But the two young orcs just kind of grinned at each other. The final challenge had begun. A few months later, Juritan was running as fast as his legs could carry him. He was exhausted, out of breath and sweating his balls off. But he had to keep going. He was a frost wolf, the heir to clan chieftaincy, and no Blackrock orc was going <laughs> to... Little effort to beat you, Juritan. You've so much muscle, your brain is starved. Skill is as important as power, but the Blackrock clan wouldn't know about such things. There wasn't any malice in their words, it was just a bit of friendly bants. Their clans had been troubled at first by the friendship between the two youths, but Juritan's argument that just because something had not been done before did not mean it could never be done amused and impressed the leaders of both clans. Plus, it helped that both the Frostwolves and Blackrocks were traditionally even tempered. If Juritan had suggested a friendship with a war song or a bone chewer, however, they probably would have nipped that in the bud pretty quick. Suddenly, the earth shuddered beneath their feet. Whilst Juritan automatically unsheathed his spiked club, Orgrim readied his hammer. It was the traditional weapon of the Black Rocks, and a simplified version of the legendary hammer he would one day inherit. The two exchanged glances, but didn't dare speak. Something was coming. Something big. The big booming noise came closer and closer, followed by an almighty crash as a tree in front of them splintered. And there it was, 
an enormous ogre. <laughs> so they cheesed it. Now very much regretting the fact that they just had a race, because they were still pretty tired from that, to be honest. But the need for survival and the adrenaline was somewhat helping to keep their legs moving. <laughs> the giant beast was gaining on them. It would catch them pretty soon. And despair washed through Juritan, quickly followed by pure fury. They'd never gone on their first real hunt, or danced by the fire with females. There was so much they hadn't done. And yet here they were, about to die. And it wouldn't be a glorious death in battle. It was to be a hilarious death, overpowered by one ogre. Juritan then turned on his heels to scream a curse at the ogre before it smashed him flat like a pancake. But what he saw made his jaw drop. Their rescuers had not uttered a sound, moved in absolute silence. And the ogre now lay on the ground, still. Hubbla 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 hubbla. I'm sorry, what? Juritan didn't understand the language. He and Orgrim had seen the Draenei before, but only at a distance. And he'd sure as hell never heard them speak. You are injured. Only my pride. You two have wandered far from home. Which clan do you hail from? I am Joratan of the Frostwolf clan, and this is Orgrim of the Blackrock clan. Two different clans. Were you challenging one another? Yes and no. We are friends. Friends? From two different clans? Yes. It's not traditional, but it is not forbidden. The Draenei nodded, and then turned to two of his companions and murmured another bunch of hibbledy jibbledy. It was a profoundly musical language. The other two Draenei listened intently, and then nodded. One of them ran off, heading southwest towards Frostwolf lands, whilst the other raced towards the east, to Blackrock lands. They will notify your families that you are well and safe. You will return home tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm happy to offer you the hospitality of the Draenei. I am Restalan, leader of the Guards of Telmor. We regularly trade with your clans, but I regret to say I do not remember either of you. But then the younglings always do seem a bit leery of us when we come to your territory. I am afraid of no one and no thing. He ran from the ogre. Orgrim's face darkened and his eyes glinted angrily, whilst Juritan lowered his head slightly. Just as he'd feared, the Draenei had seen them cheesing it, borne witness to their shame, and now they were to be mocked. That is wisdom. If you had not fled, we would be sending two corpses home to your families tomorrow. There is no shame in fear, Orgrim and Juritan. Only in letting fear prevent you from doing the right thing. One day we will be strong and full size. Then it will be the ogres who fear us. I completely agree. Orcs are powerful hunters. Orgrim narrowed his eyes, waiting for the taunt. But there was none. Come. There are dangers in Terracar Forest at night that not even the guards of Telmore would willingly face. Let's go. And so they did. By this point, both Juritan and Orgrim were goddamned exhausted. But they weren't going to be shamed twice in one day, so they kept up with the Draenei. And although Juritan kept looking for signs of a city, he saw nothing. And for a moment, he wondered if these Draenei were in fact planning on doing something bad. Taking them prisoner, maybe. Or sacrificing them to some dark god. Here we are. The two orcs exchanged confused glances. They were still in the middle of a forest. There was no town here. Resselan then kneeled down and uncovered a beautiful green crystal that had been carefully hidden amongst the undergrowth. Stegaladula magalabula. Bibbidi bobbidi boo. The forest then began to shimmer, as if it were a reflection, and then suddenly, there was no forest. No trees, only a large paved road leading towards a glorious, bustling city. We are in the heart of ogre country. If they can't see us, they can't attack us. But how? A simple illusion, nothing more. The trick of the light. Rassalan could still see the look of confusion lingering on Joratan's face, so he continued. The eyes cannot always be trusted. We think what we see is always real. That the light always reveals what is there the same way at all times. But light and shadow can be manipulated, directed, by those that understand it. In the speaking of those words and the touching of the crystal, I altered the way the light falls on the rocks, the trees, the landscape. And so your eyes perceive something entirely different to what you thought was there. And Juritan still had a dumbass look on his face, so Restalan just chuckled. Come, my new friends. Come where none of your people have ever been before. Walk down the roads of my home. The Draenei city was absolutely amazing. It was a union of stone and metal, of nature and ingenuity. Juritan had no idea what he was seeing, but he knew it was magnificent. And as he looked over to Orgrim, he could tell his friend felt exactly the same way. You are welcome here, Juritan and Orgrim. Restalan then led them forward, and as they walked the streets, the two orcs continued to soak in all the sights. There were gleaming gems everywhere, and a buttload of some strange metal that Juritan had never seen before. What is your city made of? 
Many things. We are travellers, fairly new to your world. New? It was over 200 summers ago that your people came here. We were not as we are now. No, you're not. We have watched the orcs grow in strength and skill and talent. You've impressed us. Juritan knew it was meant as a compliment, but somehow the comment stung. As if the Draenei thought they were better than the orcs. But the thought was fleeting, and was gone just as soon as it had popped in his head. To be fair, looking around at the wonders of this city, perhaps they were slightly better. To answer your question, Orgrim, when we arrived here, we utilised everything we'd brought with us. I know your people build boats to travel the rivers and the lakes. Well, we came on a boat that could travel in the sky. It was made of metal and other things. Once we realised that this was to be our home, we took part of the boat and used it in our architecture. Pfft! What a load of bollocks. Metal can't float. So one would think. But one would also think it not possible to summon the elements to fight, if one did not know better. That's different. That's magic. Or so is this. Sort of. Rassilon then beckoned to one of his men, said some more hibbledy jibbledy, and the other Draenei nodded and hurried away. There is someone I'd like you to meet, if he's not too busy. They then passed through some more streets, and at one point, Juritan saw a female who seemed about their age. As she met his gaze, she initially seemed a bit startled, but then just smiled and ducked her head shyly, and Juritan found himself smiling back. In our encampment, you'd find many children. Where are the Draenei children? Our people are very long-lived, so we do not often have children. How long-lived? Very. Suffice it to say that I remember our arrival here. It was at that point that Juritan realised the young-seeming female he just kind of eye-flirted with was probably as old as the hills. The scout that Restalan had dispatched then returned and spoke quickly, and Restalan looked pleased with whatever the scout had said. Our prophet, the one who brought us to this world, Velen, has agreed to meet you. You were to dine with him and sleep in the Magister's house. That is a very high honour indeed. That took both orcs by surprise. Dinner with the leader of all Draenei? What the bloody hell had they gotten themselves into? But the two orcs followed Restalan dutifully, as he led them the rest of the way, until eventually they arrived at the Magister's house and were shown to their room. It was an odd room. Fruits sat in a bowl ready for consumption, strange clothes were set out for them to wear, and a tub of water steamed in the centre. That water is too hot to drink and is too much for steeping leaves. It is for bathing. Bathing? To wash the dirt from one's body. We do not bathe. You do not need to do anything you feel uncomfortable with. The bath, the food, the clothes are here for your pleasure. Prophet Velen will expect to see you in an hour. I will come for you then. Is there anything you need? Both orcs shook their heads, so Restalard nodded and then left. Do you think we're in danger? No, but I feel like I'm in a cave. I'd rather be in a tent. Me too. Juritan then pointed towards the mysterious tub for bathing. Do you want to try it? No. <laughs> Both orcs laughed, but they did eventually splash their faces with the warm water and kind of enjoyed it more than they thought they would. They ate the fruit, donned the clothing that had been laid out for them, had a bit of a challenge to see who could bend the leg of a metal chair before feeling a bit guilty about how they'd broken a chair, until eventually, Restalan came a-knocking. The prophet is ready. What the hell happened to that chair? The first thing Juritan thought as he saw Velen was bloody hell he's old and tall. Welcome. I am Velen. I'm glad that my people found you today. The elder Draenei then waved them to sit, and so they did. A giant feast was laid at the table, and throughout the meal, Velen was an excellent host. He asked questions and seemed genuinely interested in the responses. How old would the boys be before they could hunt? Choose a mate. What was their favourite thing to eat? What was their favourite weapon? When my father passes, I will inherit the Doomham. It is an old and honourable weapon passed down from father to eldest child. You will swing it well, Orgrim, but I trust that it will be many years before you take on the name of Doomhammer. The fact that his dad would have to die before he became Orgrim Doomhammer seemed to have momentarily escaped the young orc, and the revelation caused him to abruptly grow solemn. Describe the hammer to me. It must be a mighty weapon. Oh, it's enormous. The stone is black and blunt and powerful. The shaft is made of carefully crafted wood. I mean, the shaft has needed some repairs over the years, but the stone, not a chip on it. It's called the Doom Hammer because when its owner takes it into battle, it spells doom for the enemy. I see. But there is another prophecy. It is said that the last of the Doomhammer line will use it to bring first salvation, and then doom to the Orc people. Then it will pass into the hands of one who is not of the Blackrock clan, and it will once again be used in the cause of justice. That is a powerful prophecy. 
Orgrim continued to enthusiastically talk about the Doomhammer, but Juritan wasn't listening. He'd seen the weapon before. And he was more curious about this Velen bloke anyway. Why was this being so interested in them? Juritan had been a sensitive boy. He knew it. His parents had been kind of concerned about it at one point. But Mother Kashur had just scoffed at them and said leave the boy to his fate. But Juritan knew feigned interest when he saw it. And Velen was not faking interest. His eyes were bright and focused. His questions were sincere. He wanted to hear about the orcs. And yet, the more he heard, the sadder he seemed to become. Can you tell us of your people, Prophet? We know so little. In the last few hours, I've learned more than any of my people have in the last hundred years. The Draenei have never withheld information, young Joratan. I believe you may just be the first who's asked. What do you wish to know? Well, Retzalan said you came here in a great vessel that can travel the skies. Tell me more of this. Okay. To begin with, Draenei is not our true name. It's a term that means exiled ones. We disagreed with others in our world. We chose not to sell our people into slavery, and for that we were exiled. We spent much time finding a suitable place to dwell, a place to call our own. We fell in love with this land, and we call it Draenor. Juritan nodded. He'd heard that term before. It was nice. The orcs didn't really have a name for the place. They just called it World. It is our term. We're not so arrogant that we believe the orcs would use it as well. But such we have dubbed it. And we love Draenor deeply. It is a beautiful world. And we have seen many. You've seen other worlds? Indeed we have. And we have met many people. People like the orcs? There is no one like the orcs. You are unique in our travels. But yes, we had been travelling for some time before we found this land. Juritan burned to ask more questions, like how long were they travelling and what their homeland had been like, etc. But there was something in Velen's face that said, Yeah, I invited you to inquire, but I'm not a big fan of telling this story. So instead, he asked them about their magic. Our magic comes from the Earth, from the Shaman and the Ancestors. Our magic comes from a different source. I'm not sure you'll understand it. We're not stupid. Forgive me, I didn't mean to imply that. Your people are wise, and you two are obviously bright, but I'm just not sure I have the words in your language. Velen was probably right. Juritan had no doubt in his mind that there wasn't a living orc that could grasp all of this in a single evening. Maybe Mother Kashir. The conversation then turned to more mundane topics. Mostly just Draenei geography. There was a sacred place nearby called Arkandun, where the dead were laid to rest. Velen normally resided in a place called the Temple of Karabor. And there were quite a few Draenei towns, but the largest one was called Shatrath. And then, the meal was over. The food was finished. And Velen sighed and got to his feet. You will excuse me. It's been a long day and I must meditate before I sleep. It has been an honour to meet you, Juritan and Orgrim. I trust we will meet again, young ones. Good night. Meanwhile, in the lands of the Frostwolf clan, Mother Kashir was fast asleep in her tent, dreaming about being not old and stuff. But a voice she recognised called out to her. Bring him. It was the voice of a man known as Talkra in life. He'd been dead a long time, but that didn't stop orcs from pestering their shaman descendants in the middle of dreams. You received the message? He and the Blackrock boy are with the Janai. They will be safe. I can feel it. Yeah, they'll be safe. Bring him. He will come to the mountain in a few months, when the trees shed their leaves to sleep. So yes, I will bring him. No! Bring him to us! Bring him to the caverns of Oshagoon! I would look upon him there. You wish me to take him to meet the ancestors? Is that not what I just said? Foolish girl! Bah! What has happened to the shaman these days? Talkra then yelled for what felt like half an hour about how in his day, shaman were better and like these bloody whippersnappers nowadays, whilst Kashir just kind of stood there in stunned silence. It wasn't unheard of for the ancestors to want to meet a particular child. Usually meant they were destined for the shamanic path. But she'd never really considered Juritan for that. It was rare for a shaman to lead a clan. There would be too much pulling him in each direction for him to be an effective leader. To listen to and honour the spirits whilst also guiding one's people would require a very remarkable orc indeed. You're not even bloody listening to me, are you? I will bring him on his initiation day. Finally! Don't fail me, you bitch! Gashir then opened her eyes. Although that last thing Talkra had said was just plain rude and unnecessary, she would do what she was told. A couple of months later, and Juritan's birthday and subsequent initiation into adulthood had finally arrived, and his heart was currently hammering in his chest, 
as he stared at the beast that was to become his prey, a Talbuck. Although you may be thinking, well, that's not exactly a vicious beast, is it? It's just a bloody antelope, and it's asleep. But Talbucks are not to be underestimated, and he was to take it down with only a single weapon and no armour, for that was the rule of the Omrigor, for reasons. There had of course been some whisperings from some of the others, things like any mature Talbuck would do to satisfy the needs of the ritual, though so, uh, you could kill a male, because they shed their horns in the autumn. One person had suggested maybe hiding some armour in the wilderness, no one would know, and the most shameful whisper of all, the shaman will determine your success by tasting the blood on your face, and blood from a long dead Talbuck tastes exactly the same as blood from a freshly slain one, if you know what I'm saying. Nudge nudge wink wink. But Juratan wasn't going to cheat, he was going to seek out a female, one that was quite well equipped with horns at this time of year. He was going to only use a single weapon, and he was going to rub its blood all over his face cheeks. He had been tracking the herd for three days though, and the whole time he couldn't help but envy Orgrim, who had already completed his rite of passage. Orgrim was a sweet, sweet summer child, so his hunt had probably been quite nice, whereas Joritan's birthday was in the autumn, and winter had decided to come ahead of time this year apparently, so the weather had been quite bitter. However, late afternoon on the third day, he'd come across some pellets of poop that were not frozen hard, they were fresh. And now, here he was, standing over a fine specimen. This one would do. Tomorrow, he will return to his people an adult male, ready to take his place in serving the clan. Hadouken! Why do we not ride? Because that is not the way it is done. Mother Kashir seemed particularly irritable today, as she and Joritan made the lengthy hike to the sacred mountain of the ancestors. To be fair, she would have deeply appreciated being able to ride the journey atop her wolf Dreamwalker, she wasn't young and fit anymore, but the traditions were ancient and extremely specific. For as long as you're able to walk, you will walk. But despite the fact that each of these trips were exhausting her more and more, Mother Kashir couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement about this current one. She was bloody curious about what was going to happen, especially since this was probably to be her last trip to the mountain, at least as a living, breathing person anyway. She knew full well that the next time she approached Oshigun, it would likely be as a spirit, What's wrong, mother? Hmm? Oh, not a thing. Twas the following day by the time they reached the entrance of the sacred cave, and as always, Kashir felt as if she was about to enter the womb of the earth itself. Juritan did his best to look brave, but you could tell he was slightly nervous. But that was a good thing, Mother Kashir thought. He should be nervous. He was about to enter sacred space at the specific request of one of his long dead ancestors. Didn't happen every day. You know that few are called before the ancestors who do not walk the path of the shaman. I do not know what will happen, maybe nothing, but you will behave with honour and respect." Juritan swallowed, nodded, and then took a deep breath, and then they entered the cave. Kashir led the way, lighting the torches that lined the walls, but as they walked down a long gentle slope, there were no more torches to light, and Juritan just kind of looked at Kashir, slightly puzzled. We will not need to bring fire to come before the ancestors. That didn't really answer any of Joritan's questions, so he was still confused, but he followed into the darkness, with Kashir guiding him, right up until she brought him to a stop in the middle of pitch black nowhere. However, a dim light then began to illuminate the room around them, and a chill filled the air. You have brought him, as I asked. Joritan shuddered but said nothing, eyes still completely focused on Kashir. You cannot see him? No, mother, I cannot. Is an ancestor present? Indeed one is. I brought him here as requested. How do you find him? I sensed something. I had thought he would be a shaman, but if he cannot see me now, he never will. But although he will not see spirits or summon the elements, he is born to a great destiny. He will be an important asset to the Frostwolf clan, to all his people. He will be a hero. Juritan couldn't hear both sides of the conversation, but he definitely heard Kashir say the word hero. So he inhaled swiftly. But continued to stand up straight and be respectful and stuff. I cannot tell. Teach him well, Kashir, for one thing is certain. From his line will come salvation. See you around, you bitch. And then poof, Talkrao was gone, and Kashir stumbled a little bit. Are you alright? I'm fine. These bones are no longer young, and the energy of the spirits is powerful. I wish I could have seen him, but I know I felt him. You did, and that is more than most are honoured with. Mother, can you tell me what he said about me being a hero? <sighs> Grandfather Talcross said it was uncertain. You have a destiny to fulfill, Joritan, son of Garad. 
Be not a fool in battle and die before you can fulfill it. Ha! <laughs> a fool does not serve his clan well, and that is what I wish to do. Then, future chieftain, you'd best be about finding a mate. I'm sorry, what? So, an old ghost said your dad's child will be the chosen one. Saviour of the universe. Right. Seems legit. We orcs had everything we truly needed. A hospitable world, the ancestors to guide us, the elements to aid us as they saw fit. Food was plentiful. Our enemies were fierce but not invincible. If the Draenei were not necessarily our allies, neither were they foe. They shared their knowledge and their bounty whenever they were asked. It was we, the orcs, who always held back. And it was we who would unwittingly be twisted to serve another's end. Hate is powerful. Hate can be eternal. Hate can be manipulated. And hate can be created. Millions of light years away, Kil'jaeden stood seething and brooding and just generally being pissed off. The exiles yet lived. He could sense them, even after all these centuries. They were lying low, too cowardly to show themselves, but he'd find them, eventually. However, the latest batch of scouts had returned with absolutely diddly squat to report, which did throw a bit of a spanner in the works. Why you let these scouts live after their failures is beyond me. Because those who fear flee, and those who sniff reward in their lord's approval stay. <laughs> there are worlds aplenty to conquer and devour in service to our master, Kil'jaeden. Give up this obsession of yours and let the fool go. We would sense it if he used his talents on any level that would pose a threat. Let him rot on some world, bereft of everything that mattered to him. It is not about rendering him powerless. It is about destroying him and all those foolish enough to have followed him. It is about crushing him for his lack of faith, for his stubbornness, for his refusal to think about what was best for all of us. Kil'jaeden knew he was wasting his breath. He and Archimond had been having this same argument for centuries, and it was likely they'd continue to have it for centuries more, because his words seemed to go into one of Archimond's ears and out the other. Archimond then tilted his head, which was a gesture Kil'jaeden recognised, one of his servants was obviously communicating with him, psionically. And without a word, Archimon walked off. He had his own schemes and machinations in service to their Dark Master, so Kil'jaeden didn't take it personally. But, in that moment, Kil'jaeden felt a slight scratching inside his head as well. T'was a voice he recognised. Talgath. What is it, my friend? Speak. My great lord, I do not wish to plant false hope, but I may have found them. Kil'jaeden couldn't help but feel a little bit excited. Talgath was only a little lower in rank, having proved his loyalty over the years. He would not say even this guarded statement without good cause. Where? There is a small world, primitive and insignificant. I have sensed their peculiar brand of magic tainting it. It's possible they may have come and gone, though. Such alas has happened before. Talgath was correct. The Burning Legion had arrived on quite a few worlds in full force, lured by the sweet essence of Eridar magic. And each time, Velen and his wretched followers had gotten wind of the approach and cheesed it. But this time would be different, for Kil'jaeden had an idea. Togath, I want you to investigate this world for me. My lord, we have descended upon worlds before and to no avail. Perhaps this time only one is sent, one who can be trusted completely. There are more ways to destroy one's enemy than with an army. Sometimes those ways are better. You wish for me to find such a better way then? Precisely. Back on Draenor, it was that time of year yet again, the Koshaag Festival. My, how time flies. This was a particularly special Koshaag Festival for Juratan though, because it was the first one since he'd been marked as an adult. No more sleeping in the child's tent for him. Now he could stay up and talk about fevers and soups. Just as he and Orgrim had learned all those years before, the fireside conversations weren't that interesting at all. But what was interesting was being here amongst a number of folks that Juratan had seen but never interacted with. Firstly, there was Gromash Hellscream, the young and slightly manic chieftain of the Warsong clan. He was only slightly older than Juritan and Orgrim, and there had been mutterings about the mysterious circumstances behind his recent rise to power, but the Warsongs did not question his leadership, and Juritan was not surprised. He was ever so slightly intense. Beside him was the enormous, imposing Black Hand of the Blackrock clan, and next to him was the chieftain of the Shattered Hand clan, Kargath Bladefist. It was also intimidating because he had a blade where his fist should be. Then there was Kilrug Deadeye, chieftain of the Bleeding Hollow. And finally, there was Nazul of the Shadowmoon clan, standing with Mother Kashir and her apprentice Drek'thar, because the shaman hadn't buggered off up the mountain just yet. 
For as long as Juritan could remember, Nazul had led the shaman. He was extremely skilled. Whilst most grunted and laboured to contact the elements, Nazul made it look easy. So Juritan kind of liked the guy. He did not, however, like Nazul's little bastard of an apprentice. I think that Gul'dan would better serve his people if he was set out as bait. <laughs> Juritan looked away so that no one would see his smirk. But Orgrim was right. Gul'dan was short and frail and the complete opposite of what an orc aspired to be. Now that one, she is a warrior born. Juritan glanced over to where Orgrim was looking and his eyes widened. Standing tall and straight, her muscles rippling in the firelight, was a female that was currently nomming on a chunk of Taubuck meat like a savage. She was the epitome of what all orcs value. Who? Who is she? <laughs> Bloody hell, mate. She's a frost wolf. I'd have claimed her for myself if she was in my clan. A frost wolf? How the balls of Juritan failed to notice such a treasure in his own clan? Draka! Oh, it's Draka. No wonder he'd not recognized her. No, Orgrim. She was not a warrior born. She is a warrior maid. You see, Draka had been born sickly. For most of his childhood, Juritan remembered hearing the adults only speak of her in low whispers. His own parents spoke of her sadly, wondering what her family had done that the spirits had cursed them so. But, by the grace of the spirits, the healing of the shaman, and the power of the will, she had cast off her childhood frailty to become this vision of female perfection. She will be his, he thought. What female could possibly deny him? No. What? Why not? I'm not yet of age. Ugh. I intended this to be a courting hunt, that much is true, but if you're not of age, I will respect that. Still, I would like your company. Let this be a hunt shared by two proud warriors, nothing more. Alright, fine. And so, they went on a hunt. It was glorious. Juritan couldn't remember being so happy. He and Draka had set a brisk pace. Thanks to his challenges with Orgrim, Juritan had developed quite a bit of stamina, and Draka was keeping up, which was impressive. Juritan slowed as they moved out into open territory and began to scan the ground. And soon enough, he spotted some tracks. Cleft hooves. One is injured. I see no blood. No blood. Look at the pattern of the prints. Juritan looked at the print, and then back at Draka, and then back at the print, and then back at Draka. Look. Watch. Draka then began to carefully place her feet into each footprint and follow their course. And finally, Juritan could see what she was seeing. The beast was limping. The indentations of one hoof were slightly less deep than the others. Bloody hell, she was amazing. It is easy to read. You would have found it yourself. No. I saw the prints, but I did not take the time to observe them in full detail. You did. You will make an excellent hunter one day. Draka straightened and looked at Duritan proudly, and something warm and weird rushed through him, which was simultaneously nice, but also he didn't like it at all. The two then followed the trail, and as they loped round a sharp turn, they found the animal they'd been tracking. Unfortunately, a wolf had found it first. The great black wolf whirled round, snarling, and the three predators then stood, regarding one another. Right up until Juritan just went ahead and charged. He swung his axe down towards it, but it retaliated with a bite at his arm, and then pounced on him. But just before the beast's jaws could close upon his face, Juritan heard a war cry, saw a flurry of movement, and the beast switched its focus to Draka, who had just poked it with her spear. Juritan then got up, hefted his axe again, brought it down as hard as he could, and felt it cleave right through the animal's body. And then there was silence. They'd survived, in an encounter against an animal that usually would take several seasoned orcs to bring down. And now their foe was dead, sliced in two by an axe, but also impaled in the heart by a spear. And Juritan realised they'd never actually be able to find out which of them struck the killing blow. And that thought made him ridiculously happy. Thank you. Draka nodded, but then chuckled a little bit. What's so funny? I know something, and you do not know it. But after this, I think I will tell you. I am honoured. I told you yesterday that I was not of age for a courtship hunt. True. Well, when I said that, I knew I would soon come of age. I see. Well, when will you come of age? Today. Juritan then looked at Draka for a long moment, until finally, he pulled her towards him and gave her a big old kiss. As time passed, and more Kashag festivals took place, the ceremony was somewhat marred by loss and tragedy. It became just as much a time for mourning as it did for celebration, and Nazul was currently staring up at the night sky, deep in contemplation about the whole thing. Firstly, his old friend Kashur, affectionately known as mother to the Frostwolves, had passed to the ancestors. 
She'd insisted on joining a hunt, which was something she'd not done for years, and had unfortunately been trampled to death by a whole bunch of stampeding cleft hooves. So that was a bit shit. And it wasn't the only tragedy for the Frostwolves. In the interim between Koshargs, their leader Garad had been claimed as well. On one fateful summer day, the Frostwolves had stumbled across no fewer than three ogres, and one of their monstrous masters, a Gron. And although the orcs were ultimately victorious, Garad and several others died from their injuries. So that was a bit shit as well. But in the sorrow of losing a leader was the joy of seeing new blood come into its own. Kashir had spoken well of young Duratan, and from what Nizul had seen, he would make a fine leader. He and his mate, the lovely Draka. Nizul then entered his small hut, one that he had once shared with his own mate, Rolkan. She'd passed to the ancestors several years ago, but she still visited him from time to time. Not with words of wisdom, just encouragement and TLC. But he still missed her. The older shaman then prepared a potion, chanting over it softly before drinking it. He knew it wouldn't actually cause a vision. Nothing would, unless the ancestors willed it. But over the years, he'd learned that some herbs open the mind, make your dreams a little bit more lucid. Nazul then closed his eyes and passed out. And the next thing he knew, he was standing on a mountain top next to his beloved Rul Khan. Nazul, my love, this is a new beginning. A new beginning? You have led our people well, but the time has come to deepen the old ways, take them further, for the good of all. Something nagged at the back of Nazul's mind. His wife had not been a shaman, nor a chieftain. She'd only ever been herself, which was wonderful and more than enough for Nazul, but the point is she'd never held any position in life that would make her speak with such authority. However, that was probably nothing to worry about. So Nazul just went ahead and ignored that alarm bell. I am listening. I knew you would. There are dark and dangerous times ahead for the orcs. We have only ever come together at the Koshag festivals. Such isolation must end if we are to survive as a race. There is a blight upon this world. It must be eliminated. Say it, and it will be done. I will always honor the advice of the ancestors. When it is eliminated, our people will stand proud and tall, even more than they are now. Power and strength will be ours. This world will be ours, and you, Nizul, will lead them. Something in the way Rulkan said the words made Nizul's heart leap. He was already powerful, already revered by the orcs, he kind of already was the de facto leader, even if no one had ever officially said it. But, for some reason, desire now stirred in his heart for even more. And fear. Tell me, Rulkan, what is this threat that must be eliminated, before the orcs can claim what is rightfully theirs? Duratan had been sat eating breakfast with Draka and the newly appointed head shaman of the Frostwolves, Drakthar, when a courier approached and handed him a letter. And in the letter, it said, Unto Duratan. Chieftain of the Frostwolf clan, the Shaman Nazul gives greetings. I have been granted visions by the ancestors that concern us all. I would speak with the leaders of all the clans on the twelfth day of this moon, as well as every Shaman. You are to come to the foot of the sacred mountain. There will be catering. If you cannot attend, I will take it as a sign that you do not care for the future of our people, and you'll be banned from any and all future brain trust meetings. Forgive my brusqueness, but this matter is of the utmost urgency. Please respond ASAP later. Juritan had told the courier to wait whilst he discussed the matter, which the courier seemed quite indignant about, but who cares? What does this mean? I don't know, other than Nazul obviously thinks this is very important. A meeting of the clans has never happened outside the Koshag ceremonies, but I've known Nazul all my life. If the spirits were to speak to any of us about something that threatens us all, they would speak through him. Ugh. Summoning you like your pets to come at his call. I don't like this, Juratan. It smacks of arrogance. I do not disagree with you. Just the tone of the letter had been enough to raise Juratan's hackles. His gut instinct was to refuse. But, as he read it again, and chose to look past the abrupt rudeness, he could see the overall intent. Something was definitely bothering Nazul, and Juratan respected the Elder Shaman enough to hear what he had to say. I will go. With all the Shaman. I'm coming too. I think it would be best if... I am Draka. Daughter of Kelkar and Rakish. I am your intended, soon to be your life partner. You will not forbid me to accompany you. Juratan then threw his head back and laughed. Draka's spirit never ceased to amaze him. He bloody loved her. Call in the courier then. Tell him that we will come to this strange meeting of Nazul's, but we had best be assured of its necessity when we are there. A few days later, 
The Frostwolves arrived at Nazul's meeting and appeared to be among the first there. Nazul himself greeted them, and as soon as Joratan saw the guy, he knew he'd made the right call to attend. The older shaman looked as though he'd aged years in the space of a few months. This was no arrogant play for power. Over the next few hours, other clans arrived, and Juratan was pleased to see the banner of the Blackrock clan. He hadn't seen his longtime friend for a while, and Draka was pleased too, because thankfully, she got on quite well with Orgrim. It's nice when that happens. It sucks balls when your partner and your best mate hate each other. News travelled around the separate clan encampments that the meeting itself would not take place until the following morning. So, Juratan, Draka, Drakthar, and the other Frostwolf shaman just kind of sat around by a fire and ate some food and stuff. However, as a shadowy form approached their little camp, Juratan got to his feet and drew himself to his full imposing height. <laughs> Don't stand up too straight. You'll do your back in. Ha! Welcome, my old friend. Juratan and Orgrim then embraced each other. As tall as the Frostwolf chieftain was, Orgrim was still bigger. In fact, Juratan couldn't help but wonder how he'd ever managed to beat Orgrim in any of their challenges. Because the guy was ripped now. Your gathering is small, but it smells the best of any of them. Then sit, tear off a hunk of Talbuck and leave your duties behind for a while. Would that I could, but I don't have much time. If the Frostwolf Chieftain would walk with me a bit, I would be honoured. Let us walk then. And so they did. They walked in silence for a time, right up until the campfires were nothing more than small twinkling lights in the distance. And then, Orgrim spoke. Black Ant did not want us to come. He thought it demeaning, that Nazor would summon us like we were pets to his call. Draka said exactly the same thing. We weren't going to come either, but I'm glad we did. You saw Nazul's face? Yeah. Blackhand is still raging against the Shaman, though. He does not see what you and I do. It wasn't Juritan's place to speak ill of another clan leader, but it was no secret what most orcs thought of Blackhand. He was a powerful orc, bigger and stronger than any other, and he wasn't dumb. He was just a bit of an asshole. However, Juritan decided to hold his tongue, I can see your struggle even in the darkness, my friend. You do not have to speak for me to know what you would say. He is my chieftain. I swore an oath to him which I will not break. But even I have my misgivings. You do? I am torn, Juritan. Torn between my loyalties and what my mind and heart tell me. May you never be put in such a position. As second, I can at least help moderate him somewhat, but not much. He is clan leader. He has the power. I can only hope that he will listen to others tomorrow and not stubbornly sit on his wounded pride. Juritan shared that hope. If things were indeed as bad as Nazul's face seemed to indicate, the last thing anyone wanted to see was the leader of one of the most powerful clans behaving like a spoiled brat. Juritan's eyes then fell upon a dark shape on Orgrim's back, and both pride and sorrow flooded him. You carry the Doomhammer now. I did not know of your father's passing. He died bravely. Do you remember that day long ago, when we fell afoul of the ogre and the Draenei saved us? I could never forget it. Their prophet spoke of the time when I would receive the Doomhammer. I was so excited about the thought of wielding it in the hunt, but... Felon, that was the first time I understood. That the day it became my weapon would be the day I would be fatherless. <sighs> it is a glorious thing. A weapon of power. A weapon of prophecy. The pride of my lineage. And I would shatter it into a thousand pieces if it would bring my father back. Without another word, Orgrim strode back towards the camps, and Juritan made no move to follow. Instead, he sat for a long time, staring up at the stars, knowing deep in his soul that soon, the world he'd known all his life was going to radically change. Juritan stood next to Draka, with his arm around her waist, in a protective gesture. He wasn't exactly sure why he felt she needed defending, there was just something in Drekthar's face, in the faces of all the different clan shamans, that chilled him to the bone. Juritan also kind of wished he could stand with Orgrim. There was no one besides Draka that he trusted more. But Orgrim, of course, stood beside his own chieftain, who was looking at the gathered shaman as if they were all pieces of shit. Looks like Blackhand's been too long away from the hunt. He's spoiling for a fight. He may well get it. Look at their faces. I've never seen Drekthar like this. Not even when Mother Kashur got all smashed up. Nazul then stepped forward into the centre of the gathered crowd, raised his hands and used his shaman powers to light a bonfire. And that parlour trick managed to gain a few murmurs of appreciation before everyone settled down. As the darkness falls, in more ways than one, sit you beside the fire. Let each clan sit to itself, with its own shaman. And I will call you forth to speak when the time is right. Perhaps you wish us to fetch a slain beast for you too. 
and lie obediently at your feet at night. Juritan recognised the angry voice, which is impressive considering everyone sounds the same. It was Gromash Hellscream. The Warsong Chieftain stood with his arms folded, glaring at Nazul, but the Elder Shaman did not rise to the bait. He just sighed deeply and continued. Many of you feel your honour is offended. This I know. Give me leave to speak and you will be glad that you are here. Your children's children will be glad of it. Hellscream growled, but then just shrugged. I have had a vision from one of the ancestors whom I trust more than I can possibly say. She has revealed to me a threat, lurking like a poisonous scorpion under a flowering bush. All the other shaman can attest to this, and they will, once they have the opportunity to speak. It grieves and infuriates me that we have been so duped. Juritan hung on Nizul's words, his heart racing. Who was this mysterious enemy? How had such a dark foe escaped their notice? The enemy of which I speak is the Draenei. And then chaos erupted. A whole bunch of orcs yelling, You what, mate? That's preposterous and outrageous! And as Juritan looked over at Orgrim, he saw in his friend's eyes the same stunned shock that he himself felt. Surely this couldn't be true. Not the Draenei. They weren't even fighters, really. They hunted, sure, but only to survive. The Frostwolf Chieftain's thoughts then went back to the day the Draenei saved him and Orgrim from the Ogre. Why would they risk themselves to save two boys if they were truly as evil as Nizul suggested? None of this made any bloody sense. However, Gromash Hellscream's terrifying war cry then filled the air, causing everyone to shut the hell up. I know this startles you. It shocked me as well. But the ancestors do not lie. These seemingly benevolent people have been waiting for years, until the time is right to attack us. They sit safely behind their strange buildings made of materials we do not understand, and they harbour secrets that could benefit us greatly. But why? Juritan hadn't even realised he was speaking until it was too late. But he was committed now, so... Why do they want to attack us? If they harbour such vast secrets, what do they need from us? And how could we possibly defeat them if this is true? That I do not know. But I do know that the ancestors are concerned. We outnumber them. Not against their superior knowledge. They came here on a ship that sails between worlds, Blackhand. You think they'll fall to arrows and axes? Blackhand didn't particularly like the way Juritan had just spoken to him, but fortunately, Nazul went ahead and interrupted before that could escalate. This has been simmering like a stew on the fire for many decades. Resolution and eventual victory will not come overnight. I'm not asking you to go to war right this minute. Just to be aware. To discuss with your shaman a course of action. And to open your minds and hearts to a union that will ensure triumph. All eyes were on Nazul, wondering where the bloody hell he was going with his words. We are separate clans, yes, each with its own traditions and heritage. I'm not asking you to give up that proud history, merely asking you to open your minds to a unity that takes clans that are strong alone and turns them into an unstoppable force. We are all orcs. Blackrock, Warsong, Thunderlord. Don't you see how little those distinctions matter? We are the same people. In the end, we want safe homes for our young, success in the hunt, mates who love us. We are more alike than different. Juritan agreed with that statement. Once again, he glanced over at his best mate, and Orgrim looked back and nodded. Juritan would not be who he was today if it had not been for Orgrim's steady strength, and he knew in his bones that Orgrim felt the same way. May I speak? Juritan turned and was surprised to see that it had been Drek'thar that had asked that question. My chieftain... What Nazul has said is true. Mother Kashur confirmed it. The rest of the Frostwolf Shaman nodded, and Juritan just kind of stared at them. Kashur said the Draenei are our enemies. I'm afraid so. It is time for the clan chieftains to listen to their own Shaman, as Juritan has just done. We will reconvene at twilight. These are the people you know and trust. Ask them what they have seen. And so, the gathered crowd began to disperse, very cautiously, with each clan heading back to their own encampments. The Draenei are not our friends. My chieftain, I know you and the Doomhammer Blackrock stayed with them one night. I know that it appears that they saved your life. But let me ask you, was there anything that seemed a bit weird about them? Juritan had a little think about it. The Draenei had appeared very, very quickly to rescue him and Orgrim from the Ogre. But then he frowned, because thinking this way made him feel like a bit of an ungrateful asshole. Your brow furrows, my chieftain. I take it your youthful faith in them is now starting to wane. Juritan didn't answer. He didn't even look at Drek'thar, just stared down at the ground. He didn't want to feel this way, but the doubt was creeping into his heart. Restalan. There was an arrogance to him, 
when he'd spoken about how they'd watched the orcs grow in strength and skill. And then there was... Speak, my chieftain. What do you recall? The... the prophet. He asked many questions. Of course he did. What an opportunity. They've been plotting against us ever since they arrived. And to find two... Forgive me, Juratan, but two young and naive children to tell them everything they wanted to know must have been quite an event. The ancestors wouldn't lie. Juratan knew this. And now that he recalled the events of that day and night in this new light, it seemed almost obvious how suspicious Velen's actions had been. There is a part of me that doubts yet, my friends. And yet I cannot stake the future of my people on such thin ice as my own personal doubts. Nazul did not propose an assault tomorrow. Only asked for us to train, prepare, and come closer as a people. This I will do, for the good of the Frostwolves, and the good of the Orcs. The Frostwolf clan will prepare for war. How easily the mind can be turned to hate from a place of fear. An instinctive, natural, protective response. Instead of focusing on the things that unite us, we focus on what divides us. My skin is green, yours is pink. I have tusks, you have long ears. Are you talking to me right now, or is this part of the story? So it was with the Draenei. It didn't matter that they'd shown us nothing but courtesy and openness. It didn't matter that they traded with us, taught us, shared whatever they were asked to share. None of that meant anything once we'd heard from the ancestors. Suddenly their differences were all that mattered now. The training had begun. Although it had always been custom among every clan to start training the younglings at the age of six, it had also always been somewhat relaxed. Besides, they were simply training to hunt animals, not sentient beings. But not anymore. A young orc no longer enjoyed the luxury of learning at their own pace. There was no time for play, or the joys of being young. Other things changed quickly too. For example, the couriers and their beasts couldn't keep up with the sheer amount of mail that was now being sent between clans. So some bright spark came up with the idea of training bloodhawks to carry the letters. And whereas the smiths and leather crafters had always focused on armour that would blunt attacks from claws and teeth, they now had to create things that would save the wearer from being impaled, or slashed by a sword. And the master smiths found themselves teaching their craft to a lot more peeps. The forges ran day and night, as did the mines. Hunts were now daily events, as opposed to only taking place when the need arose. So all in all, things had bloody changed. The younglings lined up for training looked especially young to Duratan, and Draka, who as always knew exactly what he was thinking, touched his back gently. It would be better if we'd been born in a time of peace. Even the most bloodthirsty knows this. But we are where we are, my mate. I know you will not shirk this task. No, I will not. We are warriors. We thrive on the hunt. They are small, but they are not weak. They will learn. They are frost wolves. They are orcs. This is taking too long. I know, my love, but you would not have our people go into battle unprepared. The Draenei are vastly superior. Rokan grunted unhappily, but then smiled. However, as Nizal observed her face, he couldn't help but wonder why her smile seemed forced. But once again, probably nothing to worry about. We are training as fast as we can. The spirit remained silent, making it quite clear that it wasn't fast enough. Perhaps you could help us. Perhaps there is knowledge you have that I have told you all I know. But there are other powers, other beings that the living do not know of. There are the elements, and there are the ancestral spirits. What other beings are there? You yet breathe, my mate. You are not ready to treat with them. They are the ones that have been aiding us, so that we may aid you. Please, Rokan. We need aid if we are to protect future generations from the Draenei's insidious plots. Perhaps you are right. I will see if they will speak with you. There is one whom I trust the most, whose concern for our people is deep and abiding. I will ask him. Nazul nodded, almost ridiculously pleased, and then he woke up to see Gul'dan with a fruit and fish breakfast ready. Another vision, my master. Gul'dan then presented Nazul with a cup of steaming herbal tea. T'was a concoction Rokan had advised he drink. She'd assured him that it would keep his mind and spirit open to visions. It tasted like shit at first, but after a while, Nazul had grown to quite like it. Hell, he drank it four times a day. Indeed, and I have learned something important, Gul'dan. For as long as there have been orcs, there have been shaman. Shaman work with the elements, and with the ancestors. Yeah, I know. There's more than we know. More that the ancestors can see, but we living beings cannot. Beings even more wise and knowledgeable than the ancestors themselves. 
Rukan says there is one in particular who has chosen to take the orcs under his wing, and soon he will show himself to me. And to me too, perhaps. You are a strong one, Gul'dan. I would not have chosen you as my apprentice if that were not the case. So yes, I think so. When he has deemed you worthy, as he has deemed me. I am so honored to serve. This is a time of great glory for the orcs. We are blessed to live to see it. The Blackrock clan had begged for the honor of being the first to strike. Their hunting skills were legendary, and they were the logical first choice due to them living fairly near one of the smaller, more isolated Draenei cities. However, as excited as they'd all been when that was agreed, none of them had considered just how difficult it was going to be to prepare. Mounts would need to be bred for size now, if they were to carry armor as well as orc bodies. The new armor itself chafed and was uncomfortable, and the new weapons felt a bit alien in their hands as they'd discovered whilst running practice fights against ogres. Two ogres and their master. The pitiful Draenei do not stand a chance against our might. Orgrim kind of agreed. He trusted Nazul and the shaman of his clan. Plus, he'd spoken with Juratan, and they both felt like there'd been something a little bit fishy about the Draenei all those years ago. But he still had misgivings. When had there ever been a single attack on an orc by the Draenei? A single insult. And yet here they were. Several Blackrock warriors armed to the teeth, riding to slaughter a group of the Blueskins who were doing nothing threatening at all. You look lost in thought, Orgrim. I was just wondering what colour Draenei blood is. Blackhand threw his head back and laughed, and Orgrim's jaw tightened. The ancestors don't lie, he thought. The ancestors don't lie. The Blackrocks soon came upon a Draenei hunting party. Six males and five females, who were currently in the process of isolating a young cleft hoof from the herd. Blackhand drew his company to a halt and raised his fist. You are ready? All the Blackrock Orc's eyes glowed fiercely. They were ready, so Blackhand grunted, brought his fist down, and the warriors charged. The Blueskins turned, startled, wondering what the bloody hell was going on. At first, they probably thought this group of Orcs were coming to aid them in a kill they didn't really need any help with. But when Blackhand brought his blade down and cleaved a Draenei in half, they figured it out. And to the Draenei's credit, they did not stand in stunned horror at the sight. They sprang immediately into action, but the Blackrocks were ultimately victorious, with even Orgrim smashing a whole bunch of skulls with his hammer. And then there was silence. Orgrim had always enjoyed hunts, but this, he'd never experienced anything like this. And before he knew it, he was laughing, and wondering if he'd somehow become drunk on this new sensation. A Bloodhawk arrived and Nazul unrolled its message and quickly scanned the small piece of parchment. It had been so easy, not a single casualty, only a few injuries. The Blackrock Orcs had been completely victorious. Blackhand bragged about how swiftly they'd descended on the party and broken their skulls. Surely now, the being with whom Rolkan had allied would appear. And then it did. It was glorious, radiant, so bright that Nazul couldn't bear to look at first. You have come. I knew that if we pleased you, you would come. Indeed, Nazul, shaman, soul tender of the Orcs. I have seen your masterful handling of your people, how you brought disparate clans together with a common purpose, a glorious goal, one that was inspired by you, Great One. You came to us and revealed the truth. We did what was needed. You did indeed. Glory and honor and sweet victory will be yours if you continue to do as I say. Of course, Great One, but this humble petitioner would beg a favor. There's all risked a glance up at the being. Twas enormous. Radiant and red, with a powerful torso and legs that ended in cloven hooves, like a Talbux, or a Draenei. That's a bit weird, he thought, but probably nothing to worry about. Ask, and I will decide if you are worthy. Great one, do you have a name by which we may call you? <laughs> a simple favor, easily granted. Yes, I have a name. You may call me Kill Jaden. Velen was currently in the courtyard of the Temple of Karabor, meditating, or rather, having a little chat with Kore inside his mind palace. The Draenei had fled many a world to escape the Legion, but the fact that they'd left those worlds behind, and the people of those worlds, to be utterly annihilated weighed heavily on him. However, Kore had always insisted that Velen's death would save none, but his life would save many someday. How? How is my life more important? The gathering is slow, but it continues. There are other Naru like me, who are reaching out to the younger races. Sargeras will eventually fall beneath the will of those who yet believe in what is good and true 
and harmonious. Kure had been instrumental each and every time the Draenei had needed to flee, but there would be no escape this time. Kure was dying, trapped in the very vessel it had given them to escape their homeworld all those years ago. Great prophet. Velen opened his eyes to see Restalan, looking a little bit weary. There's been another attack. I know. I felt it. What do we do? Each attack seems more violent than the last. Examinations of the body seem to indicate that they're improving their weapons. Ah, <sighs> I don't think Kore has much longer. Restalan lowered his gaze, pain evident on his face. All the Draenei understood that the Naru had effectively sacrificed itself for them, and as a result, they'd all grown quite fond of it. Its voice grows fainter, so I must go to it. Perhaps proximity will help it communicate better. You... you mean to go to the ship? Yes. Great Prophet, I do not mean to question your wisdom, but... But you do anyway. <laughs> Continue, my old friend. Your questioning always has value to me. The Orcs have adopted the vessel as their sacred mountain. I know this. Then why antagonize them by venturing there? They would surely see this as an act of aggression. You would be giving them a reason to continue their attacks against us. I have thought of this, thought long and hard on it. But perhaps it is time to reveal who we are, what their sacred mountain is. They believe their ancestors dwell there, and they may very well be right. If Kore does not have much longer, should we not utilize its wisdom and its powers whilst we can? If anyone or anything can broker peace between the orcs and ourselves, this being has that ability. This may be our only hope. Orc and Draenei can no longer live in distant familiarity with one another. There's no returning to that, my old friend. There is either war or peace, and I would never forgive myself if I did not explore every avenue to peace first. Do you understand? Restalan didn't look happy about it, but I suppose I do. At least let me send you with an armored guard. The orcs will attack before they will listen. No. No weapons. Nothing to provoke them. In their hearts, they are honorable beings. I saw so in the hearts of the two young orcs who stayed with us. There is nothing cowardly or evil in there. Only caution. And now, for some reason, fear. Kiljaden visited Nazul quite regularly, whispering his praise and congratulations and plans for future victories. And Nazul bloody loved it. The validation really had gone to his head. Even more bloodhawks arrived today. The shattered hand, the bleeding hollow, laughing skulls, all victorious. Do you see how they are coming together in a just cause, Nazul? Before, these clans would be challenging one another if they crossed paths. Now, they share knowledge, resources. They work as one to overcome a foe who would see you all destroyed. Nazul nodded, but then felt a sudden pang. He'd been so caught up in it all, but he just now realized he hadn't seen his wife's spirit for ages. Rulkan. Rulkan has done her part in bringing you to me. We do not need her as an intermediary anymore. But now that I've been convinced of your worthiness to be my voice among your people. Despite Kiljaden's comforting and exciting words, Nazul still wouldn't have minded seeing Rulkan every now and then. After all, she had been his life partner for quite a while before she died. But he didn't press any further. And then Gul'dan arrived with a missive. What is this? It was taken off a Draenei approaching from the south. A party? A single courier. The fool was walking. Nazul looked at the parchment and realised it was covered in blue stains. What had possessed the moron to walk alone, unarmed, into Shadowmoon territory? He then unfolded the message and began to scan read it. Read it aloud, Nazul. Share it with me and your loyal apprentice. And so he did. And it was at this point that he really started to have some doubts. Unto Nazul, shaman of the Shadowmoon clan, the prophet Velen of the Draenei sends greetings. Recently, many of our people have come under attack from the Orcs. What the f***, mate? Eh? For generations, we've lived in peace and tolerance. So what gives? I'm sure this is just a misunderstanding. Maybe we could meet and talk about it, so that no more lives are lost or something. The mountain. You guys call it Oshagun. The Draenei have always respected the fact that the Orcs claimed it as their holy site. But it's time to share the truth. We have more in common than you think. So let's meet at the place that holds so much meaning for both our races. On the third day of the fifth month, I and a small party will be moving in pilgrimage to the heart of the mountain. Unarmed, I invite you and any others who feel so moved to join me. Enlightened blessings. See ya. Gul'dan was the first to break the silence. Arrogance. This is an opportunity not to be missed. 
Their leader comes like a cleft tooth calf to the slaughter. What you say pleases me, Gul'dan. Nazul, your apprentice speaks wisdom. But Nazul found words stuck in his throat. He attempted to speak, twice, to no avail, until finally they came out. I do not disagree that the Draenei are dangerous, but we're not Gron, killing unarmed foes. The courier was slain. He was unarmed and even unmounted. And I didn't say I was happy about that. He should have been taken into custody and brought to me, not killed. Look, Velen will not be permitted to defile our sacred place, but I will not have him killed without having the chance to speak with him. We might learn something. Yes, when one is in pain, one will reveal all he knows. Those words startled Nazul. Did the magnificent radiant omniscient being just suggest torture? What kind of magnificent radiant omniscient being would suggest torture? May I make a suggestion? What? The Frost Wolves. Their leader once tasted Draenei hospitality, and although he has not hindered our efforts, I do not recall hearing of any attacks from them on the Draenei. We could kill two birds with one stone. Make Joratan of the Frost Wolves prove his loyalty by having them bring Velen and his party to us. Nazul felt both pairs of eyes staring at him, waiting for him to agree, and the elder shaman, for the life of him, wasn't quite sure why he was so reluctant to. Beads of sweat began to form on his brow, until finally, he spoke, ever so slightly relieved to hear his voice sounding strong and sure. Agreed. It's a good plan. Find me a pen and parchment and I shall notify Juratan of this duty. Juratan sighed and passed the letter to Draka, and as she read it, eyes darting frantically over the words, she looked ever so slightly pissed off. There's always a coward to lay this at your feet. The request came to him, not to you. I have promised to obey. Nazul speaks for the ancestors. Yeah, well, I don't know if I trust Nazul. Juratan nodded, but we both trust Drek'thar, and he confirmed what Nazul said. The Draenei are plotting against us, and now it looks as if Velen is insisting on entering Oshagoon. Juratan once again regarded the letter. I'm just glad Nazul hasn't asked me to slay Velen. Perhaps once we have him in our power, we can convince him to change his ways. Maybe even negotiate peace. Juratan's heart yearned for peace. As great as his life was with Draka, as proud as he was of his clan, he knew he'd be much happier simply doing as his father had done. Hunting beasts, dancing in the moonlight, discussing soups. He hadn't told Draka this, but he was secretly glad that they had not yet conceived a child. It was not exactly a fantastic time to bring one into the world. The young orcs these days were having their childhood stolen from them. And as chieftain, Juritan would not hesitate to have his son or daughter trained like the rest. Wouldn't be fair to the other parents otherwise. And whilst Juritan thought of these things, Draka watched him with intense narrow eyes, as if she could read his thoughts. I will tell the courier that his master may rest content. I will not shirk my duty. Meanwhile, Velum was meditating again, holding the violet fragment of the Atamal crystal close to his heart. He also had the red and yellow ones. The other fragments were placed elsewhere in Draenei territory. But of the seven fragments, the violet one was his favourite. Its power opened his mind and spirit, always made him feel stronger when he meditated with it. But even so, he could no longer hear Kure's voice. My prophet, the courier you sent to the shaman Nazul was killed. I sensed his death, but I had hoped it was an accident. You were certain he was murdered? Nazul admitted it and offers no apology. So much for your theory that they would not attack an unarmed man. I had hoped for better. Azul says that an orc contingency will meet with us at the base of the mountain. So he's not coming? Nope. Who does he send in his stead? The letter doesn't say. Give it to me. The Resalan did. Velen uncurled the parchment and began to read it. Your courier is dead. It is fortunate that those who slew him thought to search the body for his missive. I have read it and I agree to send a contingency of orcs to speak with you. I guarantee nothing. Not your safety, not a truce, nothing. We will hear you out, but that's it, you prick. Well, that wasn't the response Velen was hoping for. What the bloody hell had happened to the orcs? It was inappropriately sunny and nice the day the meeting finally came. Juratan felt like it should be grey and cloudy, or raining, but the sun didn't give a shit about his feelings. Duratan had picked a pretty strategic position for himself and his warriors. They would see Velen's travelling party approach long before they were spotted themselves, and they would leave the Draenei no avenue to flee 
should that be a thing that they tried to do? My chieftain, you are doing what you've been told to do. These beings are our enemies. Juritan nodded and wished he could believe that as easily as every other orc seemed to. And then, they're coming. Five of them, unarmed. And so, Juritan straightened and gripped his battle axe tightly. Not only were the Draenei not dressed in armour, they were so garishly clad that only a blind orc would have failed to spot them. They wanted to be seen. They wanted the orcs to be confident that they carried no weapons. But was it a trick? After all, a shaman didn't need a spear to be deadly. The Draenei continued to approach at a completely confident, serene pace, as if they just did not give a shit. But after several long minutes, the leader of the Draenei and the chieftain of the Frostwolves found themselves standing face to face. Been a long time, Velen. Long indeed, Juratan. Are you still friends with Orgrim? I am indeed. He carries the Doomhammer now, and is second in his own clan. A deep and unquestionably genuine sorrow flitted across the old Draenei's face. I hope his father and yours passed with great honour. We are not here today to speak of the past. We are here because you have informed us that you dare trespass on our most sacred place. Velen held Juritan's gaze and nodded. I had sent a missive to Nazul, Juritan. Not to you. He has declined to meet with me. I wonder, did he share this missive with you? There was no need for me to read it. I was asked to come in his stead and I have done so. I see. Then he did not tell you why I wished to come today. I do not need to know your purpose, Draenei. But you do. Or else this conversation will be for nothing. Felon's voice was clear and crisp. There was nothing old or frail about it. For the first time, Juritan could see the sheer strength of Velen's will. This mountain is sacred to your people. We know this, and we have respected it. But it is also sacred to us. Deep inside the mountain is a being that has long cared for the Draenei people. It is older by far than anything either of our minds can grasp, and more powerful. But even old and powerful things can die, and it is dying now. There is wisdom and guidance and reconciliation we can have from it. Your people and mine. We blasphemer! Juritan was quite shocked to see that outburst had come from Drek'thar, and he looked absolutely furious. Oshagoon belongs to us. It is the home of the beloved dead, and your hideous cloven feet are not fit to take one step up its blessed sides. Velen also seemed taken aback by the outburst, but he stretched out a hand imploringly. Your spirits are housed within these walls, it is true, and I would never dare say otherwise. But they are drawn there because of this being. It seeks to... Drek'thar then bellowed in outrage. That was pretty much the opposite of the right thing to say from Velen, and he'd gone ahead and made things worse. So much so that the orcs behind Juritan started to surge forward. However, Juritan then struck Drek'thar right in the face. Everyone chill the f out. We take them alive. I will slay anyone who harms them. And then there was silence. Velen, you and your people are now prisoners of the Frostwolf clan. I expected nothing less. All five of the Draenei somehow maintained their composure as they were stripped and searched. Juritan's stomach turned at the insults, jeers and spits that came their way, but he did not stop it. My mate, can you not silence them? I want to see how the Draenei react. Draka looked at him, but then nodded and withdrew. He knew she wasn't happy about this. He didn't like what he was seeing either. But he was walking a delicate line and he knew it. My chieftain, come and see what they've brought us. Juritan walked over to Rokar, his second and peered into a sack that had been confiscated from the Draenei. And inside were two exquisitely beautiful stones. One red and one yellow. Juritan really wanted to touch them, but stopped himself and instead looked over to Velen. What are these? Crystals. They are part of our legacy, bequeathed to us by the being that dwells in the mountain. <sighs> you would do well not to mention that again. Bind their hands, put them on wolves with the shaman to guard them. Give these crystals to Drek'thar. We will take the Draenei back with us. The ride back was a long one. Juritan spent most of it wrestling with his emotions. Eventually, they arrived back in the land of the Frostwolves. The prisoners were ungraciously shoved into two tents, one for Velen and one for the rest, because Juritan intended to speak with Velen alone as soon as the excitement settled down somewhat. And soon enough, it did, so he entered the tent. He'd ordered for Velen's hands to be tied, but whoever had carried out that order had obviously decided to take it a bit further because Velen was strapped up like a gimp. So Juritan cursed under his breath, pulled a dagger and cut Velen free. He told them to bind you, not truss you up like a talbuk. Your people are very eager, it would seem. Juritan then handed the old Draenei some water and watched him gulp it down, and gave him a bit of porridge as well, which Velen did not touch. 
Not quite the feast you served Orgrim and I, but it is nourishing. Did you get what you wanted from us that night? I don't understand. We merely wish to be good hosts to two adventuresome boys. You expect me to believe that? It is the truth. It's your choice as to whether to believe it. Why are you trying to destroy us? What have we ever done to you? I might ask you the same question. We never lifted a finger to harm you, and now over two dozen Draenei are dead from your attacks. The ancestors do not lie to us. We have been warned that you are not what you seem, that you are our enemies. Those crystals, what are they? Some kind of weapon? We thought they might help us better communicate with the being in the mountain. We are not an enemy to the orcs. Juritan, you are wise and intelligent. You're not one to blindly follow. I don't know why your leaders are lying to you, but they are. You're better than this. You're not like the others. You're wrong, Draenei. I am proud to be an orc. I embrace my heritage. You misunderstand. I do not malign your people. I'm merely... Merely what? Merely telling us the only reason we see the beloved dead is because of your god? Trapped in the mountain? It is not a god. It is an ally. It would be one to your people as well if you permitted to be. Duratan paced, hands clenching and unclenching. He was bloody furious. But he knew anger wasn't going to help the situation, so he took some deep breaths. Velen, your claim is arrogant and offensive. You're asking me to choose between the people I trust, the traditions I've been raised on, and your word. Know this, Velen, I choose my people. If you and I come face to face on the field of battle, I will not stay my hand. But if Nizul wants you, he should have come for you himself. You will not take me to him then. You were supposed to deliver a prisoner to Nazul. I was to meet with you and listen to your words. Had I captured you in battle, stricken a weapon from your hands and wrestled you to the ground, then yes, you would be a prisoner. But there is no honour in binding a foe who extends his hands willingly for the rope. We're at an impasse, you and I. You insist you have no ill will towards the orcs. My leaders and the ancestors say otherwise. Juritan then knelt before the Draenei. They call you Prophet. Do you know the future then? If so, tell me what you and I can do to avert what I fear will unfold. Give me something, anything, to take to Nazul to prove what you say is true. Juritan realized he was kind of begging, but he didn't care. He loved his wife, his clan, his people. If begging could stop an all-out war, then beg he would. The future is not like a book one can read. It is ever-changing. I am granted certain insights, but nothing more. If anything can be done to avert this, it lies with the orcs. Not with the Draenei. All I can do is tell you what I have already said. The river's course can be changed, but you are the ones who must change it. Juritan closed his eyes for a moment, and then stood up. So be it. We will keep the crystals. Whatever power they have, our shaman will learn to harness it. Get up. You and your companions may leave safely, or as safely as you might, in the darkness with no weapons. If you come to your deaths this night when you are past our territory, it will not be on my head. Juritan then marched out of the tent, told the guards that Velen and his four companions were to be safely escorted to the border. But Drek'thar then appeared, out of nowhere. Juritan, what are you doing? Nazul expects prisoners. Nazul can take his prisoners himself. I am in command and this is my decision. Do you question it? I do. You heard what he said. He claims the ancestors are like moths to a torch around this god of his. The arrogance. Enough, Drek'thar. Enough. Velen and the others made their way through Tarakar Forest, and the Draenei leader's heart was heavy. That hadn't exactly gone brilliantly. The orcs were now in possession of two of the Atomau crystals, and Velen had no doubt their shaman would indeed unlock their secrets soon enough. At least they hadn't found his favourite violet one, but the outlook was grim. One look at the Frostwolf camp had revealed that the orcs were preparing for war. Hell, not just preparing for it, convinced of the certainty of it. Velen then turned to his companions and looked at them sorrowfully. The orcs will not be dissuaded from this path. Therefore, if we are to survive, we too must walk the path of war. And far in the distance, broken, dying, deep within the sacred mountain, Kure uttered a deep agonized cry, and Velen bowed his head. The ancestors are angry with us for letting Velen go. Juritan shook his head, but there was no denying that the mountain just cried. It was not a cry of anger. It was the wrenching sound of ultimate grief, and the Frostwolf chieftain could only shudder as he wondered why the ancestors mourned so very deeply. You what, mate? Nazul looked absolutely furious. 
His apprentice Gul'dan winced as his master flew into a fit of all caps rage. But Juritan did not bat an eye. I released the prophet villain. Your orders were to take him and the others prisoner. Now, Nazul was only partly angry because of the missed opportunity, the fact that they could have extracted quite a bit of information from Velen, but the main reason he was angry was because he was absolutely terrified of how Kil'jaeden would react. The beautiful being had seemed so bloody excited about the plan, and somewhere down the line, it had been agreed that Velen would be given to Kil'jaeden as a sort of present. What the hell was he supposed to do now? But the fact that he felt fear, rather than being disappointed by the failure, was not lost on the Elder Shaman. You put me in charge of capturing them, and capture them I did. But there is no honour in a prisoner taken willingly. You want us to be strong, as a people, rather than individual clans. We can't do that without a code of honour. Juritan carried on talking, but Nazul wasn't listening. Because he was starting to have some doubts again. There were a lot of alarm bells about this Kil'jaeden bloke. But Nazul then realised he could feel Gul'dan's gaze upon him. Probably wasn't the best idea to let his apprentice witness his doubts. Nazul then blinked and came back to himself and noticed Juritan had stopped talking and there was an awkward silence. Which continued because Nazul didn't have a bloody clue how best to handle this. Juritan was well regarded among the clans. If he were to be punished for his disobedience, there would be many who would respond with sympathy to the Frostwolf clan. Which in turn might cause a rift in this horde that Nazul was trying to build. On the other hand, if he condoned Juritan's actions, it would be a slap in the face to those that fervently supported that the Draenei must die. So Nazul just kind of stared at Juritan, who started to frown impatiently. My master is so overcome with rage that he cannot speak. You have disobeyed a direct order from your spiritual leader. Return to your camp, Juritan. My master will send you a letter shortly, conveying his decision. Juritan looked back to Nazul, his dislike of Gul'dan plain on his face, and Nazul gathered himself, stood tall, and finally spoke. Be gone, Juritan. You've pissed me off. And worse, you've displeased the being who has shown us such favour. You will hear from me soon enough. The Frostwolf Chieftain bowed, but did not leave immediately. He had one more thing to say. There is one thing I do bring you. We took these off the prisoners. Juritan passed a small sack to Nazul, and the Shaman extended his hand to accept it. Nazul realised his hand was shaking, and hoped desperately that both Juritan and Gul'dan would believe it to be rage shakes, not fear shakes. Our shaman believe they may hold power that we can use against the drama. And then, Juritan bowed again, and left, like a boss. Forgive my interruption, my master. I feared the Frostwolf boy would misinterpret your anger as hesitation. The words sounded sincere enough, and Gul'dan's face seemed sincere, and yet, Nazul just could not bring himself to trust his own apprentice. There was a time when he would have confessed his doubts, but now, the Elder Shaman knew one thing for absolute certain. Do not tell this little asshole the truth. I was indeed overcome with rage. Honor serves nothing if it hurts your people. What did Juritan give you? I will examine it first, and share it with Kil'jaeden, apprentice. There's always looking for a reaction from Gul'dan, and for the briefest of moments, anger flitted across his apprentice's face, before quickly disappearing. Of course. Forgive me, I was just curious to see if the Frostwolf Chieftain had contributed anything of worth. Indeed, I will let you know if I learn anything. Gul'dan then bowed, and also left, not like a boss. And Nazul, as soon as he was certain he was alone, opened the sack and gasped, for inside were two glowing gems. The Elder Shaman gingerly touched the red one and gasped again, because energy, excitement and a sense of power flowed through him. He suddenly wanted to grab a weapon and swing it around. This was indeed a gift to the orcs. If they could figure out a way to utilise this red-hot passion for fighting that lurked inside the stone, then they'd be stronger than ever. It took a great effort of will for Nazul to put the red crystal down, but once he did, he turned his attention to the yellow one and picked that one up. But this time, there was no excitement, no urgency. As he grasped the yellow crystal, his mind cleared, and he realised up until this point he'd been seeing things as if through a weird fog or something. There was a new clarity, a precision to everything. In fact, it was so clear that Nazul began to perceive this mind-opening experience as painful, and kind of went, Ugh, as he instinctively threw the crystal across the room. Kil'jaeden was just as furious as Nazul feared he would be. Forgive me. Nazul felt like the being was just about ready to smite him, so he squeezed his eyes shut in anticipation. But after a few moments of nothing happening, he reopened them to see Kil'jaeden once more looking serene, poised and calm. I am disappointed, but I know two things. The Frostwolf Chieftain is the one responsible, 
and you will never, ever trust him with an important task again. Of course not, my lord. Never again. But we found these crystals for you. They are of little use to me, but I think your people might find them helpful in your battle to crush the Draenei. That is your battle, is it not, Nizul? Yes, Lord. It is the Ancestor's will. It is my will. Y yes, and I obey you in all things. Kiljaden seemed satisfied, so he nodded and buggered off, and Nizul sank back, wiping the sweat from his brow. But, out of the corner of his eye, he then saw a flash of something. Bloody Gul'dan. He'd seen everything. Sometime later, Nazul looked at the mountain of missives that had arrived and read one. We have been planning an attack for some time now, and last night we went ahead and did it. No one was left alive, not even the few children we found. We took a whole bunch of things, food, armor, weapons. We will share this bounty. Their blood, blue and thick, dries now upon our faces. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go dance in the moonlight and masturbate. There was no need to read them all. The essence of these letters were always the same. A successful attack, glory in the killing, ecstasy of the blood spilled. With each month that had passed, the orcs had grown even more skilled at killing the Draenei, especially now that they had the stones that Juritan had confiscated. But despite all this, Nazul still couldn't shake those nagging doubts. He tried fighting against the suspicions, but they kept coming back, and he could no longer bear it. So he jumped on his wolf, Sky Chaser, and set off. He'd never ridden to the Sacred Mountain before. He'd always walked, as is tradition. But he needed to return before he was missed. The urgency of his mission would surely mitigate any offence to the ancestors. Soon enough, Nazul reached the Mountain of Spirits, told his wolf to stay, and climbed the mountain. Inside the cavern, he took a deep breath, and waited, and waited, and waited, and nothing happened. But he didn't panic. Sometimes the ancestors take their time. But after what felt like an hour passed, he started to worry a little bit. Ancestors, beloved dead, I've come seeking, no, begging for wisdom. I've lost my way. I question the path I'm on, and I beseech your guidance. Please, if ever you loved and cared for those who have followed in your footsteps, come to me now and advise me, so I may lead them well. As all knew he sounded lost and pathetic, and for a moment, stubborn pride made him feel flush with shame. But then he remembered this wasn't about him, it was about the orcs, and what was right for them. Suddenly, the room then started to glow, and a figure appeared. Rulkan. Tears streamed down Nazul's face at the sight of his beloved, but his heart then lurched with pain as he saw the look in her eyes. It was hatred. Even more figures then started to appear, all with that same look on their faces, and Nazul felt nausea well up inside. Why? Why do you all look at me so? You are not a saviour of your people, but their betrayer. No, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Surely it's not too late. You are not strong enough. If you were, you would never have walked so far down this path. You would not have been so easily fooled into doing the bidding of one who has no love for our people. You bitch. I don't understand. You came to me, Rukan. I heard you. Kiljaden was the one you wanted me to embrace. The great friend to all the orcs. Rukan said nothing. She didn't have to. Even as the words tumbled from Nazul's lips, he came to understand how profoundly he'd been misled. It wasn't Rukan that had been visiting him in those dreams. It had all been a trick. The ancestors were right. Any shaman who could be so easily deceived could never be trusted to put things right again. Nearly a hundred Draenei were dead. There was no turning back. No requesting aid from the ancestors. One by one, the floating ghostly figures Rulkan included began to turn their backs on Nazul, figuratively and literally, and the elder shaman, crushed beneath the weight of everything he'd done, buried his face in his hands and wept. And crouching in the darkness, down one of the tunnels, Gul'dan listened to the sound of his master sobbing, with a real douchebag grin on his face. Kil'jaeden would definitely appreciate hearing about this. As Nazul rode back from the Sacred Mountain, all he wanted was for the Dark Knight to swallow him whole. How could he return to his people knowing what he had done to them? But on the other hand, he couldn't just cheese it. Where would he even go? Kil'jaeden would probably find him even if he found the best hiding place in the history of hiding places. He contemplated suicide, but there was no honour in that. Not amongst the orcs. If he took his own life, then he would not be permitted to live on as a spirit. But there was one option. He could just pretend he didn't know. Yes, that's what I'll do. Feign ignorance. 
That's how I can mitigate the damage this interloper has done. Finally arriving back, Nazal looked at his hut. He was looking forward to going in and simply collapsing, but a bright light nearly blinded him as he entered. You would betray me then? Nazal fell to his knees, and as the light dimmed, Nazal saw Gul'dan standing beside Kil'jaeden, grinning darkly. What have you done? I have informed Kil'jaeden of a rodent. Nazal noticed that there was still snow on Gul'dan's shoulders, and put two and two together. His apprentice had followed him. Gul'dan had heard the words of the ancestors, and still, he clung to Kil'jaeden, choosing power over his own people. It wounds me. I chose you, Nazal. I gave you my powers. I showed you what you need to do to advance your people. You deceived me. You sent me false visions. You maligned the ancestors and all they stand for. I don't know why you're doing this, but it's not out of love for my people. And yet they flourish. They are united for the first time in many centuries. United under a lie. Nazor felt almost giddy in his rebellion. It felt good to defy this powerful jerk. Perhaps if he kept pressing, Kil'jaeden would lose his temper and solve all of Nazul's problems by destroying him. But Kil'jaeden did not respond with deadly fury. Instead, he just looked at Nazul like a disappointed parent. You may yet regain my favour, Nazul. I have a task for you. If you complete it, your lapse of faith will be overlooked. Nazul stared at the being, confused. All he wanted to do was tell Kil'jaeden to sod off, but this time, the words wouldn't come out. What happened with the Frostwolf Chieftain troubles me. Not least because he is not the only one who has murmured against what is happening. There are others. The one who wields the Doomhammer. Some among the Bladewind and Redwalker clans as well. There must be no risk to the success of my plan. We must ensure their cooperation. For now and for all time. What is it you suggest, Great One? Kil'jaeden smiled at Gul'dan, and as all could already see the bond forming between them. There is such a way to guarantee obedience. A way to make them forever bound to us. The feeling of horror Nazul had felt hearing the ancestors increased tenfold as he listened to Kil'jaeden outline his plan. The orcs would be forever bound, forever loyal, forever enslaved. He looked up into Kil'jaeden's blazing eyes, but once again, no words would come. So he just stared, transfixed, like a bird before a snake. Do you refuse your chance of redemption, Nazul? And then, as if a spell had been removed from Nazul, the words that had been stuck in his throat came rushing out. Words that he knew would mean his doom. I refuse utterly to forever doom my people to a life of slavery. Know this, shaman. Your choice averts nothing. My desires will still be carried out. Your people will still be slaves. But instead of leading them and lingering in my favor, you will be forced to be a helpless observer. I think that will be much sweeter than simply killing you. Kil'jaeden narrowed his eyes, and Nazul realised he couldn't even move, let alone speak now. Even his heart beat only by the will of Lord Kil'jaeden, and he knew it. Kil'jaeden then turned to Gul'dan, who looked back like a sad, pathetic puppy, hungry for praise. There is no need to trap you with pretty lies, is there, my new tool? You do not shrink from the truth. Indeed, no, Lord. I live to do your bidding. <laughs> well, if I will do away with lies, then so must you. You live for power. You hunger for it. Thirst for it. Ours is not a partnership of adoration or respect, but one of convenience and selfish benefit, which means that it will likely last. Various emotions flitted across Gul'dan's face, and Nazul, even in his wretched state, at least took some pleasure in his former apprentice's unease. As you will. Tell me what you would have me do, and I swear it will be done. You have no doubt perceived that I wish to exterminate the Draenei. Why I do so is no concern of yours. The Orcs are doing moderately well at this, but they can do better. They shall do better. A warrior is only as good as his weapons. I intend to give you and your people weapons such as you have never conceived. It will take a little time. You must be educated first, before you are fit to teach the others. Are you ready, Gul'dan? Are you willing? Begin the lessons, glorious one. You will see how apt a pupil of yours I am. Meanwhile, Duritan was covered in blood. Much of it his own. What the bloody hell had happened here? Everything had started off okay. They'd found the hunting party, initiated the attack, waited for the shaman to use their magic. But they didn't. Instead, Frostwolf after Frostwolf fell beneath the shining blades 
and blue-white magics of the Draenei. At one point, whilst fighting for his life, Durotan had caught a glimpse of Drek'thar using his staff to hit things, despite the fact that Drek'thar's actual weapon skills were absolutely shit. But before Durotan could yell, what the hell are you doing, over to his clan's elder shaman, he was knocked to the ground. And then, as he looked into his attacker's eyes, he realised it was none other than Restalan. The Draenei captain of the guard's eyes widened in recognition, and he stayed his blow, and then uttered something in his hibbledy jibbledy language, causing all the other Draenei in the fight to halt. Durotan got to his feet, and realised there were only a handful of his warriors left alive. A few more moments of battle, and the Draenei would have slaughtered them all. But Restalan then spoke. For the act of compassion you showed our prophet, Durotan. You and those who yet live have been spared. Treat your wounded and return to your homes. But do not think to receive such mercy from us again. Durotan wobbled, as if he'd had too much to drink, blood dripping from his wounds. But he forced himself to stay on his feet, as the Draenei turned and disappeared over the horizon. But once they had disappeared, he fell on his ass. Durotan! Oh, thank the ancestors. Draco was still alive. Drakthar then hurried over, placed his hands over Durotan's heart and murmured something, and warmth then flooded the Frostwolf chieftain. At least they still let me heal. Tend to the others, and then we will speak. So, Drakthar and the other shaman quickly made their way around the battlefield, attempting to heal any wounds they could. But after everything that could be done was done, Durotan looked around to see no fewer than 15 bodies, including Rokar, his second. This was a slaughter. Fifteen of our kin lie dead before us. The earth drinks deeply of their blood, and yet I never saw you or any of the shaman lend your skills to the fight. For a moment, Jakthar couldn't speak, and there was an awkward silence. Until... The elements. They wouldn't come. What? I asked all of them in turn. They said... They said they would no longer permit us to use their powers. Durotan's shock was broken by Draka's yell. This is a sign! A shout! A goddamn battle cry that what we're doing is wrong. Durotan was still slowly trying to comprehend the magnitude of this, but he nodded. If it were not for the mercy Restalan had shown them, they'd all be dead, and the elements were condemning what the shaman were asking of them. Let us get the injured back to their homes swiftly, and then I will send out letters. If what I fear is true, it's not just our shaman who have been shunned by the elements. We must confront Nazul. How is it we did not see? It is easy to lay the blame on the charismatic Kil'jaeden, or the weak Nazul, or the power-hungry Gul'dan. But they asked each individual orc to pretend that hot was cold, that sweet was sour. Even when everything in us screamed against what we were being told, we followed. Are we absolutely certain that Christy Golden wrote this story 15 years ago? Perhaps I, too, would have obeyed like a whipped cur. Perhaps the fear was so great, and the respect for our leaders so ingrained. Or perhaps I, like my father and others, would start to see the flaws. Blackhand looked out from under his bushy eyebrows and frowned. But to be fair, he was always frowning. When Gul'dan had requested to meet with Blackhand a fortnight ago, and demanded that he bring his most promising shaman but tell no one, Blackhand had agreed. He'd always liked Gul'dan. Better than Nazul, in fact. Although he wasn't entirely sure why. But as Gul'dan stood there and explained the situation, the Blackrock chieftain figured it out. He liked Gul'dan because this former apprentice now master was just like him. He had no use for ideals, only practicalities, and they both shared the same cravings for power. Nazul is an honoured and valued advisor, but it has been decided that I would be a better choice to lead the Orcs from now on, and a wise leader surrounds himself with trusted allies. Those who are strong and obedient, who will fulfil their obligations, and for their loyalty, they will be held in high regard and richly rewarded. Blackhand recoiled at the word obedient, but the whole high regard and richly rewarded thing sounded pretty cool. You asked for the shaman. I assume you know what is happening with them. I have heard. The elements are no longer obeying them. Some of them are beginning to mutter it is because what we're doing is wrong. Do you believe that? I don't know what to believe. This is all new territory. The ancestors say one thing, but the elements won't come. Blackhand was harboring a growing suspicion, but he held his tongue. Many orcs thought him a fool, and he preferred to keep it that way, because it gave him somewhat of an advantage. But Gul'dan now stared at him, with a glint in his eye that suggested maybe he was fully aware that there was more to Blackhand than he let on. We are a proud race. It is sometimes painful to admit that we do not know everything. Kill Jaden and the entities he leads, the mysteries they harbour, the power they wield. We are as ignorant children before them, 
that they are willing to teach us. Share with us some of this power. Power that is not dependent on the spirits of air, earth, fire, and water. Gudan then waved his hand in a dismissive gesture. Power such as that is feeble, unreliable. It can desert you in the middle of a battle and leave you helpless. Black Anne's face hardened because he and his clan had witnessed this very thing. A whole bunch of clans had. And suddenly, fighting the Draenei had become a lot harder real fast. Imagine what you could do if you led a group of shaman who controlled the source of their powers, instead of begging for it. Imagine if these shaman had servants who could also fight on your side. Servants who could, for example, send your enemies fleeing helplessly in terror, suck their magic dry, distract them. I can imagine success under those conditions. Success almost every time. Exactly. But how do you know this is true, and not some false promise whispered in your ear? Gordon's douchebag grin then widened. Because, my friend, I have experienced it. I will teach your shaman everything I know. All right then. That is not all that I can offer. I know a way to make you and your warriors more powerful, fiercer, deadlier. All this can be ours if we but claim it. Ours. I cannot waste my time speaking to every single leader of every single clan every time they have a complaint. There are those in agreement of what you and I think is the best way to proceed, and those who are not. Go on. However, Gul'dan did not go on. At least not immediately. Instead, he went silent. And Blackhand just kind of kicked some stones on the ground for a little bit. Most of the orcs thought him to be impetuous and hot-headed, but he knew the value of patience. I envisioned two groups of leaders of the orcs. One... A simple governing council to make decisions for the whole, its leader elected, its business conducted openly for all to see. The second, a shadow of this group, hidden, secret, powerful. This shadow council will be comprised of orcs who share our vision and who are willing to make the necessary sacrifices to obtain it. I see. So a public leadership and a private one. And to which, Gul'dan, shall I belong? You have charisma, strength. Even your enemies know you are a master strategist. It will be easy to have you elected as leader of the Orcs. I am no puppet, of course not, which is why you will belong to both. We cannot work together unless we can trust one another, after all. Blackhand looked into Gul'dan's eyes and smiled. He didn't trust this guy in the least, but it didn't matter. They both wanted power, but they weren't in competition with one another. But those thoughts were then interrupted by movement in the corner of his eye. And as he looked, he saw Nazul sort of weakly moving about. What about him? He means nothing. The beautiful one wishes him kept alive for the moment. He has something special in mind for Nazul. He will still be a figurehead. Love for Nazul is too deeply ingrained in the orcs for him to be cast aside. But he is no threat to us. The Blackrock Shaman, you say you will train them in these new magics? I will train them myself. If they adapt well to the new arts, I will place them first among my new warlocks. Warlock? So that was what he was calling it. Sounded interesting. What say you to my proposal, Blackhand? I say hail to the Horde, and hail to the Shadow Council. Meanwhile, at the sacred mountain of Oshagoon, a pretty pissed off crowd of orcs had gathered, yelling rabble rabble and stuff. Juridan had sent out letters to those he trusted, and had received confirmation that the elements had indeed shunned all of the orcs. And so, a whole bunch of clan leaders and their shaman had come to the sacred mountain demanding that Nazul give them an explanation. I know why you've come. It is indeed true that the elements no longer answer the shaman's call for aid. Juritan regarded Nazul and noted that he looked even more frail than usual, more downtrodden than Juritan had ever seen before. Some of you, upon discovering this, leapt to the conclusion that what we are doing is wrong. But that is incorrect. What we are doing is achieving power the likes of which we've never seen. Gul'dan has studied these powers, and he will answer any questions you have. Nazul then stepped aside, allowing Gul'dan the spotlight. What I am about to tell you may be hard for you to accept, but I have faith that you are not close-minded when it comes to ways to better ourselves. Just as we were surprised to learn that there were powerful beings, other than the ancestors and the elements, we have also discovered that there are other ways to harness magic, Power that is not predicated on asking, or begging, or pleading. Power that comes because we are strong enough to demand it to come. To control it when it does. To force it to obey us, rather than the other way round. 
Gul'dan then paused for dramatic effect, and Durotan turned to Drek'thar. Is this possible? I have no idea. But I tell you, after that last battle, Durotan, we were doing the work of the ancestors. How could the elements refuse us under those circumstances? The shock and shame was still evident in Drek'thar's voice, and Durotan could kind of understand. The Charmin must have felt like a warrior that reached for his axe only to find a big flaccid willy instead. I see you are all finally starting to understand the value of what the beautiful one is offering. I have studied with this great entity, as have these few noble shaman. Gul'dan then stepped back to reveal a whole bunch of shaman dressed in leather armor. What they have learned will be taught to every single shaman who wishes to be instructed. This I swear to you. Follow me now, and you will see their formidable skills for yourself. For some reason that he didn't fully understand, Duritan suddenly felt ill. And Draka, noticing his abrupt paleness, squeezed his arm assuringly. What is it? I don't know. I just feel as though something terrible is about to happen. I've been feeling that way for a long time. However, Juritan had no choice but to put all his effort into keeping his face neutral. He was responsible for the welfare of his people, and his position with Nazul and Gul'dan was already pretty precarious. If the Frostwolf clan were to be exiled from this new wider horde, it would almost certainly mean extinction for them. Sometime later... Gul'dan, the mysterious new shaman, and the large gathering of orcs reached a large open valley, and Gul'dan halted in front of a tent. He then beckoned some Blackrock warriors over, who proceeded to enter the tent, and as they came back out again, Duritan saw that they were now accompanied by some Draenei prisoners. When the Blackrock clan fought with the magic I am about to share with you, their victory was so absolute they were able to take several prisoners. These prisoners will allow me to show you what this new magic can do. Duritan was bloody angry now, Slaying an armed foe in combat was one thing, slaughtering helpless prisoners was another. But as he opened his mouth to yell his protests, a hand touched his arm. It was Orgrim's. You knew about this. Keep your voice down. Yes, I knew. I was there when we captured them. It is the way of such things, Juritan. It did not used to be the way of the orcs. It is now. It is a sad necessity. For what it's worth, I do not believe that this will become a common practice. The goal is to slay the Draenei, not torment them. Juritan stared at his old friend, and Orgrim stared back for a few moments before looking away. It was understandable, really. There wasn't anything Orgrim could have done to prevent this. He was second in command, oath-bound to support his chieftain. Gul'dan then gestured to the first Blackrock shaman in line, and they, looking slightly nervous, closed their eyes and concentrated. A sound like rushing wind filled the air, whilst the shaman glowed a kind of weird purple, and then suddenly... A little imp dickhead appeared. Pretty little pets, to be sure. But what do they do? The crowd laughed, and Gul'dan smiled at Gromash indulgently. Patience, Hellscream. One of the Draenei was then cut loose from the rest and shoved forward, and the little imp that the first shaman had summoned started jumping about. And then suddenly, fire erupted from its hands and slammed into the helpless Draenei. And a ball of darkness formed at the shaman's fingertips, rushing towards the prisoner as well. He screamed in pain as his blue flesh bubbled and melted, and then he was silent and still. And if that wasn't bad enough, Joritan then stood shocked as most of the crowd around him erupted into cries of approval and delight at the sight of a bound foe dying in helpless torment. And Joritan threw up a little bit in his mouth. He danced in this valley, sung to the moon, conspired with a boyhood friend, met his beloved, and now here he was watching his own people revel in suffering and death. Behold! I give you warlocks. There were a lot of wild celebrations that evening, but Juritan didn't take part in any of them. In fact, he'd forbid any of the Frostwolves from participating as well. And so, sat by the fire, there was a pretty awkward silence. My chieftain, will you permit us to learn the ways of the warlocks? I have a question for you first. Do you approve of what was done to the prisoners today? It would be better had we attacked them in honest combat, but they are our enemies. They've proven that. Proven that they will fight back when attacked. That is all that's been proven. I know, this is the will of the ancestors. But today I beheld something that I never thought I would see. I saw the sacred fields, where for countless years our people met in peace, defiled by the blood of those who couldn't even lift a hand to defend themselves. Juritan then saw movement at the edge of his little circle, and caught Orgrim's scent, but he continued. In the shadow of Oshagoon itself, those who slew the Draenei today did not do so to protect us from an immediate threat. They butchered prisoners in order to show off. Orgrim coughed, and Juritan motioned him forward. Orgrim, 
The first warlocks are from your clan. What are your thoughts? If we are to fight the Draenei, and even you Frostwolves are resigned to the necessity of it, then we should fight to be victorious. The elements have abandoned the Shaman. They are fickle and unpredictable at best. They were never their most reliable allies. But these new creatures, this new power, seems more dependable. But there was something about them. Draka, I know your concerns. They were definitely not natural powers. But who's to say that's wrong? They exist, so they must have some place in the order of things. Fire is fire. Whether it comes with the spirit's blessing or whether it comes from the fingers of a little dancing thing. I agree with our esteemed guest. We have committed to the battle. Surely we do not fight to lose it. Draka shook her head, still definitely unhappy about the whole thing. It is more than summoning fire, or even the strange bolts of darkness. I have fought Draenei, I have slain Draenei, and never have I seen them writhe in such pain, or scream in such torment. And the beings who are serving the warlocks, they seem to enjoy it. We enjoy the hunt. Juritan didn't like disagreeing with Draka, but, as always, he needed to see all sides of an issue in order to decide what was best for his clan. Is it wrong to wish to win? Is it wrong to take pleasure in the victory? In the hunt? In the victory? No. But I'm talking about the suffering. Perhaps the beings who are summoned to serve feed on that. Perhaps it is necessary to their existence. But it's not necessary to ours. I have always been a shaman. I was born so. And I will embrace the path of the warlock if my clan leader will permit it. Because I understand what those powers can do for us. I'm sorry, Draka, but this is necessary to our existence. Without this, the Draenei will obliterate us. Draka sighed, buried her face in her hands, and wept. And once again, there was nothing but silence around the fire. In fact, Juritan realised it was too silent. There were no sounds of night. No birds. No insects. Almost as if they'd been driven from this place after what had happened. But for some reason, I will permit the Frostwolf clan to learn these arts. Thank you, Juritan. You will not regret this. That night, Juritan had quite a bit of trouble trying to sleep, and Draka tossed and turned next to him, grunting and sighing, obviously having quite a bit of trouble trying to sleep as well. Eventually, Juritan just gave up and lay awake, thinking about the events of the day. Everything in him screamed that it was wrong to embrace this warlock path, but what could he do? The elements had deserted the orcs. The Draenei would wipe them out if they didn't have some form of magic to defend themselves. Juritan then got up, left the tent and sat by a fire, and started to comfort eat. But a courier then rode past, tossing a scroll to Juritan before riding off, and the Frostwolf chieftain unfolded it and sighed as he read its contents. There is to be another meeting in two days. The chieftains will gather to elect a leader who will speak for you all, make decisions for you all. A war chief. Make sure you bring ID in your own pencil or something. You might as well stay home. The outcome is decided anyway. You didn't used to be so cynical. I did not used to live in such times. But in his heart, Juritan knew Draka was right. There was only one orc that was well known enough, charismatic enough, to win sufficient votes. Blackhand. Grumash Hellscream might give him a bit of a run for his money, but he was too impulsive. It was Blackhand's shaman that had become the first warlocks, and his clan had won more victories against the Draenei than anyone else. And sure enough, two days later, Juritan watched with dull eyes as the votes of the clan chieftains were tallied, and Blackhand of the Blackrock clan was elected war chief. Juritan didn't even bother to object. What was the point? He could already feel the eyes on him, suspiciously watching for any sign of disloyalty. At one point, Juritan looked over at Orgrim, standing seemingly steady and supportive next to his leader. However, Juritan knew Orgrim better than anyone, when he saw the slight frown on his old friend's face. It seemed like he was just as unhappy with the decision, but he too was in no position to object. One could only hope that as second in command, Orgrim may be able to mitigate some of the damage Blackhand was almost definitely going to cause. Blackhand himself stood with false modesty, waving and smiling at the cheering crowd. My orcish brothers and sisters, you honour me. I will prove a worthy war chief of this vast sea of noble warriors. Day by day, we improve our weapons and our armour. And now, we reject the unpredictable elements and embrace true power. Power that our warlocks control. They wield it without groveling or begging to anyone or anything. This is liberation. This is strength. We are of one purpose. Wipe the Draenei from our lands. They will be unable to resist this tide of warriors and warlocks. We are their worst nightmare. To battle. For the Horde. 
and the crowd went mental. Juritan and Draka didn't hang around much longer after that. They'd buggered off because they were both disgusted. But the shaman remained behind for several days for training. And when they returned, Juritan could see that they stood taller and prouder already. This new magic had given them all back their faith in themselves. And for that, Juritan was grateful. He loved his clan. They were good peeps. It had been difficult seeing them broken and disheartened. The Frostwolf Warlocks practiced their skills on beasts at first, joining hunting parties. The attacked creatures seemed to suffer just as much agony as the Draenei prisoner had, which Juritan wasn't a big fan of. But after a while, the creatures seemed to suffer less. They were in just as much pain, but the Warlocks had leveled up a bit, killing faster and more efficiently. Scrolls arrived at the Frostwolf encampment almost daily as well. Blackham was obviously having a whale of a time as Warchief. Juritan had to admit though, receiving regular updates about things was appreciated. But one day, someone other than a courier arrived at the Frostwolf camp. Juritan recognised their garb as one of Blackhand's personal warlocks, Kirkul. Chieftain, a word with you from the warchief. Juritan nodded and motioned Kirkul to follow him, and they walked for a bit until Juritan felt certain they would not be overheard. What is it? The Blackhand sends one of his most important warlocks to me. I'm riding to all of the clans. The tone of Kukul's voice said it all. The Frostwolves were not being particularly honoured. Know your place, peasant. The most important factor in our eventual and glorious victory over the Draenei is numbers. They are few, we are many. But we need to be more. So what is it Blackhand wants? Shall we leave off fighting for mating? Start pumping out more soldiers? Not leave off fighting, but yes. Encourage your warriors to procreate. You will receive accolades for each child that is born to your clan. That will help. But we need more warriors right now, not six years from now. Juritan stared in stunned silence. He'd actually been joking. What the bloody hell was going on? Summon all your younglings. I don't understand. Summon them for what? Kakul sighed, as if Juritan himself was just a foolish child. I have the ability to accentuate their growth. We will push them forward a bit. If we take all the children who are between six and twelve now, age them to twelve, we will increase the numbers of warriors on the field by almost 50%. Absolutely not. It's not a choice, Chieftain. It's an order. Any clan that refuses will be branded traitors. Exiled. You and your mate will be executed. Is that what you want? Again, Juritan stared in stunned silence, although he was now quite clearly shaking with anger. So you'd rob them of their childhood then? For their future? Yes. I will drain a little of their lives. Only six years worth. They will come to no harm. The Blackrock children were fine. Blackhand insisted his two sons and daughter be the first to be honoured. In return, your young ones will be able to fight for the glory of the Horde now. They can make a difference. Juritan wasn't in the least surprised Blackhand had permitted this to be done to his own children. And not for the first time, Juritan was kind of glad he didn't have any. The only saving grace was that there were only a few kids in the Frostwolf clan. Five, between the ages of six and twelve. Still felt like five too many, but... What choice did he have? Do what you must do. For the Horde. I said, for the Horde. The next thing that happened was barbaric. Kukul cast a spell on the five Frostwolf children. It took everything in Juritan to force himself to remain impassive as the kids writhed in pain. Bones were stretched, muscles burst in unnatural growth, and yet the expression on Kukul's face was ecstatic. He bloody loved it. For an awful moment, Juritan found himself wondering if the Warlock was going to stop at 12, or just carry on until the children were shriveled husks. But thankfully, he did stop. And the Orcs, who mere moments ago were small children, now stood there like, all right, mortgages, tax returns and stuff. And Juritan turned to Kakul. You've done what you came to do, now f off. What? Chieftain, you can't talk to me like I said f off. Juritan then shoved Kakul hard, and the warlock went tumbling backwards. Blackhand will not be pleased to hear of this. And the Frostwolf chieftain knew any words that came out of his mouth would doom his clan, so he just walked off. For a while after that event, no further requests had come to the Frostwolf clan. Juritan had been both relieved but also concerned about that, and his concerns were absolutely justified with the arrival of a new missive. Old friend, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that you're being watched. They will set a task for you, one that they know you can complete. You must do it, mate. Don't refuse. There was no signature, but Juritan knew it was Orgrim's handwriting. He'd taken quite the risk sending this, but his friend's warning had arrived just in time because that afternoon, another courier arrived, 
handed Juritan a message, and then just kind of stared at him. Uh, thanks. I've been instructed to wait for a reply. So, Juritan went ahead and read yet another letter. You have now had time to see the skills of our newly trained warlocks in action. It is time to take the attack to our enemies. The Draenei city of Telmor is close to your borders. Orgrim has told me that as boys, the two of you entered that city, that you saw the secret of how the Draenei keep themselves unseen. Orgrim also tells me that your memory is excellent, and you will no doubt remember how to expose the city for an assault. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what destroying this city would mean to the Horde, and to the Frostwolf clan. Reply to this letter immediately so we can begin preparations. For the Horde. Juritan was bloody furious. How could Orgrim reveal such information? And put Juritan on the spot like that? But his anger subsided somewhat when he realised this information, the way the city was hidden, Juritan's uncanny memory, that could have been dropped in conversation at any point over the last god knows how many years. It wasn't necessarily so much that Orgrim had sold him out, it was more likely that Blackhand was just intelligent enough to pick up these little nuggets of information and store them away for future use. The threat in the letter was pretty blatant. If Juritan agreed, he'd prove his loyalty. If he refused, probably wouldn't end so well. So once again, Juritan made the only decision he could possibly make. I accept. For the Horde. The War Chief will be pleased. I was told to give you the following. The courier then reached into their little man purse, pulled out a sack and handed it to Juritan. Your warriors and your warlocks will need to train with these. Juritan immediately recognised the contents of the sack. The crystals he'd taken from Velen. Ironic. He was now expected to use them against the very people he'd taken them from in the first place. A few days later, the war party gathered at the Frostwolf encampment. Most of the warlocks and warriors were from the Blackrock clan, but there were a few war songs and some shattered hand. The mistrust and contempt from these visitors towards the Frostwolves was pretty obvious and Juritan knew it was no accident that they were all from the most martial clans. They were there to make sure the Frostwolves didn't do anything stupid. By daybreak, a small army of orcs were on the move, with Juritan and Orgrim up front, riding side by side. Been a long time since we passed this way. I'm not even sure we're going the right way. This forest has changed. Grown. I remember the way. Soon enough, Juritan brought his wolf to a halt and dismounted. It was definitely around here somewhere. He couldn't help but hope that the Draenei had remembered that they'd exposed their secret all those years ago, and maybe changed their weird magical crystal's hiding place. But, as he knelt down in the place that Restalan had done so many years ago, there it was. There was no turning back now. We found it. Everyone, get into position. The stone was really calming to hold. It was almost as if it was comforting Juritan, despite what was about to happen. Juritan then took a deep breath, and recalled the words that Restalan had spoken. Segala doula, magala boola, bibbidi bobbidi boo. And the grand illusion veiling the city of Talmor faded away. Juritan quickly shoved the city veiling crystal into his pack, alongside the red and yellow ones, mounted and rode with grim determination. Although he'd made a private vow to himself that he was not going to attack an unarmed foe or child, this was still very much a kill or be killed situation. Especially since the Orcish war party had wasted no time entering the city and already sliced their way through several peeps. Juritan couldn't help but wonder how the city of Telmor had received no advanced warning of the Orc's approach. They had scouts, after all. One could only assume that they were complacent, that they'd never even considered the possibility that someone could breach their super-complicated light -like manipulating magic. But, even though the Orcs may have caught them unawares to begin with, it didn't take long for the city guards of Telmor to counterattack. In fact, Juritan turned in his saddle barely in time to deflect a sudden blow from a sword, and once again, he was filled with shock as he recognised his attacker. And Restalan recognised him too. But he didn't give a shit this time. All debts between them were paid. So he immediately grabbed Juritan, yanked him off his wolf and threw him to the ground. And then raised his sword. Luckily, or unluckily, depending on how you want to look at it, Juritan's wolf Night Stalker was trained almost as well as Juritan himself. The beast whirled towards Restalan the moment it felt its rider's absence, and bit down hard on the Draenei's arm. And that little distraction allowed Duritan to regain his bearings, swing his axe as hard as he could and slam it right into Restalan's midsection. And just to rub salt in the wound, Night Stalker went ahead and ripped the Draenei's arm off, because why not? And the captain of the guards of Telmor was now the captain of the guards of Nomor. But Duritan did not permit himself regret. He just got back on Night Stalker and sought out his next target. There was still Draenei aplenty to slaughter. The rage boiling inside him felt kind of good. His senses were heightened. The air was filled with cries of bloodlust, of fear and terror, the sounds of battle, and the smells of blood and piss and poop. 
Jotan then sensed his next target, because they were suddenly right next to him. So he bellowed his clan's war cry, raised his axe, and turned to face them, only to see a child, screaming in fury as she tore with bare hands at his armoured leg. But Jurutan halted his axe mid-swing. He'd vowed to not harm a child. That was not the code. That was not the way of the orcs. But a lot of good that did, because the shattered hand orc then impaled the child with a spear from behind, and tossed her body aside as if it were nothing. You owe me one, Frostwolf. And then he was gone, presumably to murder a whole bunch more children. And Juratan threw his head back and cried. Mainly, he cried out to the ancestors, but also he just full-blown cried. <laughs> the next few hours played out pretty much as you'd expect them to. Dranai was slaughtered, the streets were caked in blue blood, the city had fallen. Juratan approached the largest building, the Magister's house, the place where he and Orgrim had eaten dinner with the Prophet. Not much of a Prophet, if he'd not foreseen this black moment, Juratan thought. Nightstalker just kind of wandered off up the steps, and Juratan was kind of curious himself, so he moved forward. As Juratan entered the Magister's seat, and peered through the many doorways in the corridor, he saw ransacked rooms. Some empty, some crammed full of adult orc warriors absolutely trashing the place. Enough. But no one listened. Orcs continued to just punch holes in walls for the pleasure of it, and throw fruit around for no reason. Enough. This time, Orgrim heard his friend and halted his warriors. A Warsong representative came to his senses and calmed his peeps as well, and Drek'thar managed to soothe the warlocks. Listen, we have taken the city. It's now time to take what we need from it. The orcs were indeed listening now, finally. First we attend to the injured. We will not leave our brethren to suffer in the streets. Guilt flashed across a number of faces, and Joritam realised with disgust that many of these warriors had completely lost all empathy for their own people. Completely forgotten that there were still orcs writhing in pain outside whilst they'd been enjoying pissing in plant pots and stuff. But he pushed his feelings down and nodded to Drek'thar. Warlocks don't have healing spells, but they had once been shaman. They at least knew how to tend to wounds in a more mundane fashion. So Drek'thar motioned to the other casters and they hurried outside. Next, the city has supplies the likes of which we've never seen. There's food, weapons, armour. Other things we don't even understand. Things that will serve the Horde in its quest to... Juratan couldn't even bring himself to finish that sentence. In its quest to wipe out the Dranai. In its quest. We are an army. An army marches on its stomach. We need to be well fed, well watered, healed, rested, protected. Orgrim, you take a group and start at this end. Guthor, you take a group and head back to the gates. Work your way up the main road until you meet Orgrim's group. And anyone who has any healing knowledge, report to Drek'thar and do exactly what he tells you to do. What should we do if we find any Draenei still alive? It was a good question. What indeed? The Orcs did not have any kind of infrastructure to take care of prisoners. Hell, the only purpose of a prisoner would be for negotiation, so there wasn't really much point in the Horde taking any. Their entire goal was total extermination of the Draenei. Kill them. Kill them all. And so, the Orcs went ahead and did those things. And Juritan found himself wishing that Nightstalker had not been so quick to protect him. If Resilan had won in that battle, he never would have had to say the words that he just uttered. That was an excellent test. Kiljaden looked very happy. Kiljaden looked very happy indeed, and Gul'dan basked in his master's approval, whilst Nazul just kind of stood there, eyes down to the floor. But he was listening. I confess, I was surprised by Juritan. I expected him to resist. But the city lies claimed and broken. All the Draenei who once lived there are gone. Most of them dead. Most is not good enough, Gul'dan. Gul'dan flinched slightly at the criticism. I think we can all relate to knowing that one person who is never bloody satisfied. And once again, Gul'dan wondered about the connection between Kil'jaeden and the Draenei, and why his master despised them so much. It was our first attempt at taking the battle to them, rather than attacking lone hunting parties, Great One. All things considered, I think we did okay. True enough. And there is yet time. During the several days since the attack on Telmor, Gul'dan had offered the fallen city to Juratan. He was mighty impressed with the job the Frostwolf had done, pleased with his leadership qualities. But Juratan had declined the offer, stating that the Frostwolves would continue to live in their ancestral lands. So the Black Rocks took it instead. And it wasn't long before they were sitting in chairs, eating at tables, using cutlery, and sleeping in lavish beds and stuff. They trained with Dranai weaponry, adopted Dranai armour. They even started wearing leftover Dranai clothing as casual wear and pyjamas. 
Gul'dan knew that there were many who wondered why neither he nor Nazul had taken the city for themselves. Gul'dan had been tempted to do so, but Kil'jaeden had advised him not to. The less Gul'dan claimed for himself publicly, the greater his reach and influence would be. By all appearances, Gul'dan was advancing the Orcs as a race, giving them power and eliminating their enemy. But it wasn't about the Orcs as a race. It had never been about the Orcs as a race. It was about power, getting it, wielding it, and keeping it. Nazul didn't get it. Blackhand didn't get it either. None of them grasped the vastness of Gul'dan's ambitions. Gul'dan then glanced over to Nazul with contempt, sat huddled in the corner. What a loser. And Gul'dan then turned back to Kil'jaeden, who nodded. You have names in mind for your Shadow Council, yes? Summon them. They will come when you call, and they will dance to your tune. I will see to that. Over the following year, the Big Brain Orcs got to work on understanding Draenei technology. Building began on a central fortress, which Gul'dan called the Citadel. It was a place where a standing army could be conveniently quartered, trained and equipped, etc. Every Orc had been given a role. You had warriors, you had warlocks, you had healers, and you had crafters. All equally important in their own way, although some did consider the crafters a lower class of Orc. But even though every member of every clan was working as hard as they could, and Gul'dan had spies in each clan to make sure of it, all of these advancements were still not enough. The taking of Talmor had been largely down to luck. The Draenei had felt completely and utterly protected by the magic of the Green Crystal, but they weren't going to make that same mistake twice. No, Gul'dan knew that the Horde were going to need allies. Ogus. Yes. No. Come now, Blackhand. Calm yourself and listen to what I am saying. You will be the one to benefit most from this, after all. That got him. Blackhand grunted, but seemed to visibly calm down. They are filth, Gul'dan. They've been our enemies longer than the Draenei, and with better reason. How is it that I will benefit? There are some that still mutter that you were not elected fairly. If you succeed in this, it will add more glory to your name. Perhaps. But will the Orcs even agree to this? They will if we tell them to. Sometime later, Orgrim shifted uneasily and stared at his leader. Not only had he been involved in countless hunting parties to eliminate the Ogre threat, but he also had a kind of personal reason to hate them. He'd never quite got over the fact that he'd run away from one all those years ago. But Orgrim knew his leader was a good strategist. The plan was sound, if you could detach yourself emotionally from it. The Black Rocks had captured three Ogres and eventually, after several days of explaining everything slowly and repeatedly, made friends with them. And now, here they were standing just outside a huge ogre settlement. And by they, I mean Blackhand, his sons Rend and Mame, the three ogres, Orgrim, and a small army of nameless Blackrock Orcs. Orgrim again looks at his leader. Was he going to make a speech? Orgrim hoped not. Blackhand was good at fighting, not words. And to his relief, Blackhand did not make a speech. He just looked at his sea of warriors, nodded, and then the attack got started. Initially, the ogres were kind of confused by the sight of three of their own charging towards them with an army of orcs, but the complete morons eventually began to comprehend that they were under attack, and then they rallied. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold! Hold! And so, the Black Rock warriors stayed their hands, and then retreated a little bit so that the dumbass ogres could catch up with what was going on. Orgrim then watched as the three ogres the Black Rocks had befriended started talking to their own kind, and couldn't help but wonder why this plan had involved them all rushing in, rather than just sending the three ogres in in the first place. Can't wait till we can kill them again. If we succeed, they'll be fighting alongside us. You won't be allowed to kill them. Heh, <laughs> right. Kill them, on the sly. Several are dead already trying to make this plan of your father's work. He wouldn't like you undermining his efforts. Who's gonna tell him? I will. If this works and they listen to us, if any of them turn up dead, yours is the first name I'll mention. Rend glared at Orgrim. It was probably just childish petulance, but Orgrim couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. He didn't like Blackhand's sons. There was a darkness in them. If the day ever came that they started using their brains as well as their muscles, Rend and Mame would be even more dangerous and deadly than their father. Told you he wouldn't listen, Rend. Old man's forgotten what it's like to have balls. Let's go. And off they went. Although Rend did throw one final sneer at Orgrim, but Blackhand then appeared and indicated that he and Orgrim should approach the Ogres to find out how the negotiations were going. We know like Grom. They hurt us. Orgrim felt no sense of pity for the creatures. Serve them right. What you give us if we join you? Well, 
For one thing, we won't kill you. You'll have food, shelter, and the delight of smashing Dranai into small wet stains on the grass. An ogre then started literally jumping up and down excitedly. <laughs> Smash Dranai's back doors in. And Black Hand just kind of patiently waited for the ogre to finish whatever it was bloody doing. So, are we in agreement? No more hurting of ogres. What is your name? Kroll. Kroll then. When do you think we should lead our combined assault? Now. Before Orgrim or Black Hand could say anything, the ogre captain bellowed a whole bunch of noise, and the entire ogre encampment started collectively jumping up and down. <laughs> Black Hand looked at Orgrim as if to say, What the hell are they doing? And Orgrim just kind of shrugged. He then pulled out a cleft hoof horn and blew on it, and heard Black Hand's army cheer in the distance. Things were now moving so quickly that Orgrim could only hope the Blackrock warriors remembered the rest of the plan. Soon, they would be slaughtering ogres aplenty, but they had damned well better be killing the right ogres. Because if they didn't, if they gave these ogres any reason to question this sudden and weird alliance, things were probably not going to end well for the Blackrock clan. And Orgrim did not feel all that optimistic, to be honest. The Blackrock clan had always been fierce in the hunt, but recently there was a sort of manic fury that had begun to creep through the clan. Not to mention the weird green tinge that had started to appear on some of the orc's skin. But that was probably nothing to worry about. Juratan lifted his head and sniffed. There was a scent in the air, one he couldn't quite place. Kind of like something was burning, but it wasn't that. Once upon a time, he could have turned to Drakthar and asked him what the smell was. And Drakthar could have used his shaman powers to ask the air for information and details. But not anymore. Not now that Drakthar and the others were warlocks. It hadn't rained for a while, and this summer seemed hotter than usual. In fact, it was the second summer in a row, where there'd been hardly any rain, and Juratan constantly found himself walking around with swamp ass. On a whim, the Frostwolf chieftain dug his fingers into the soil beneath him, and found that it was sandy and dusty. It wasn't the fertile soil he was used to. Nothing was going to grow in this shit. Draka then approached and gave Juratan a big old hug, and they stood like that for a bit before she released him. We never relied that much on what we could grow anyway. We've depended on what we could hunt, mostly. But the animals we hunt survive on what the Earth provides. We're all connected. The Shaman knew that. One of the younger warlocks hurried past and Draka fell silent. The little thing then turned to look at Draka and smiled, showing a mouthful of pointed nasty teeth. And Draka couldn't help but shudder. I received another letter. We must all prepare for a long march. We are to leave our lands. You want me? Black Hand's orders. He's relocated to this new citadel, and he wants his army there with him. It's no longer enough for us to join together to attack. Now we must all live together, and be ready to follow wherever Black Hand leads us. Draka stared at him, incredulously, before quickly reading the scroll itself. Guess we'd better prepare then. And then she walked off, and as Juratan watched her leave, his heart ached once again. As the Frostwolves observed the citadel for the first time, they were stopped dead in their tracks. And whilst many around him murmured things like, Look at the size of it! And, It's bloody impressive, that is! Juratam found himself thinking, That is a bloody eyesore and out of harmony with everything we are. The design of the Citadel almost seemed alien. There was nothing orcish about it. Draka and Juratan then exchanged a silent glance. Were they the only ones left who saw this for the monstrosity it truly was? But, the Frostwolf clan continued forward, and proximity to the fortress did nothing to make it seem more attractive. More buildings came into view, and they too looked dark and ugly. Members of the Blackrock clan greeted the Frostwolves, and directed them to the designated part of the complex, so they began setting up tents and stuff. And when dusk came, Juratan received a summons for he and a number of his clan to head to the courtyard, and so they did. They heard the drums first, causing Juratan to tense up a bit. They'd been specifically instructed not to bring any weapons, and that was about all they'd been told, so things were starting to feel a bit ominous. The drums came closer, and the earth beneath Juratan's feet started to vibrate, which was also a little bit concerning. However, two Blackrock Riders then came into view looking really pleased with themselves. Do not fear, proud members of the Horde. Our new allies, brought into our ranks by the mighty Black Hand, are approaching. Welcome them. The new allies then appeared, and Juratan's jaw dropped. Ogus, what the hell? We will crush the Draenei. Crush, crush, crush. For a sick, dizzying moment, Juratan was but a child again, fleeing from such a monster. And the next thing Juratan saw in his mind's eye was his father, smashed and broken. Orcs were now fighting alongside monstrous, feeble-brained creatures 
in an effort to destroy an intelligent, peaceful race. The world had gone mad, Joritan thought. Life doesn't make any f***ing sense anymore. Meanwhile, Velen shuddered. His assistant attempted to offer him a nice soothing brew, but he waved it away. A beverage wasn't going to come for him. Telmore had fallen, and with the city, his dear friend Restalan. And that news was only made more painful by the revelation of how it had happened. Velen had truly believed there was something special about Juratan, and the fact that the Frostwolf chieftain had let him go, rather than hand him over to Nazul, had only served to confirm his faith. But it turns out, Juratan's an asshole. He and Orgrim were the only two orcs that had ever witnessed how the green stone protected the city. Couldn't possibly have been anyone else. There was even worse news about the attack as well. Only a handful had escaped and fled to the Temple of Karabor, and they did not bring word of simple bows and arrows, of spears and axes. They also spoke in hushed voices of greenish bolts of terrible pain, of torment beyond anything imaginable, of little creatures gibbering at the feet of those who wielded this magic. They spoke of Minari, this at least helped Velen to finally understand what the balls was going on. The abrupt attacks from the orcs, their advancements of technology and skill, the fact that they'd turned their backs on their own religion. It was just like back home. The orcs were nothing more than pawns, being used by Kil'jaeden in his endless pursuit of the exiled ones. If this had happened anywhere else, the response would have been pretty straightforward. Velen would gather his people, and they would run away. But that wasn't going to be possible. The ship had crashed. Kore was dying, and they liked it here. This was their home now. However, that didn't stop Velen from grasping his favourite purple crystal and desperately pleading for guidance from the dying Naru. Kore, old friend, I miss your wisdom. Gordan looked around the room and felt really proud of himself. Everything was going as planned. His shadow council had been formed, and Gordan felt pretty confident that he'd chosen well. They were all eager to turn their backs on their own people and Black Ham was still foolishly under the impression that he was part of it, despite the fact that the real meetings always took place after he'd been dismissed. Greetings. How are the various clans reacting to the idea of ogres as allies? Kargath, let's start with you. They are primed for bloodshed. They don't care who helps them slit Jani throats open. Laughter filled the room as many of the council nodded in agreement. I have heard protests from some in the White Claw clan, and Joritan of the Frostwolf still bears watching. Do not fear. I have had Joritan in mind for some time. Why has he not been eliminated? It would be easy to replace him with another, more in line with our plans. He's constantly disagreeing with everything. That is precisely why I still need him alive. He is known for a more moderate stance. When he does finally go along, anyone else who might have had doubts goes with him. But... What if there comes a time when he does not agree? A line he's not willing to cross. Then we will deal with him. In a way that best advances our power without placing it at risk. As we always do. Gordon then leaned forward, as if to say now it's time for the real business. Speaking of those who have reservations, I have heard that there are some who continue to try and contact the elements. And the ancestors. One of the members of the council shifted uneasily. I've tried to dissuade them, but I, I don't see how I can punish them for it. It was the belief that the ancestors wanted us to attack the Draenei that made this whole thing possible in the first place. That is the bait that hooked them, but that is no longer necessary. We must make sure that there is no turning back. We've been lucky in our campaign, and with the Ogres, success is likely to continue. But if there are any setbacks, any battles that go poorly, then those who still hold shamanism close to their hearts may find an appreciative ear. It would be unfortunate if for some reason the ancestors were actually able to communicate with their descendants. Gordan then glanced at Nazul. It had only been when that loser had travelled to the Sacred Mountain that he'd learned the truth. The illusion had fooled even him, a very powerful shaman, right up until that point. So therefore, the answer seemed pretty simple. Seal the goddamn mountain and be done with it. I don't understand. Drek'thar had bought one of the youngest of the Frostwolf Warlocks, called Goon, to Juratan because the boy had some questions. What is wrong with hoping the elements will one day work with us again? And why can I not go to Ashagoon? And Juratan didn't really have any answers to those questions. Gudan had recently made a declaration. No one must ever practice the shamanic arts again. Or else. The order had seemingly come out of nowhere, and Juratan himself wondered why Gul'dan had given it in this time of crisis and need. And because Joritan had no answers for the boy, 
He grew kind of angry. In order to triumph over the Draenei, our war chief has made certain allies. These allies have given us the warlock powers you control. Don't lie, kid. I know you're pleased with the results. At first, the boy said nothing, and Juritan frowned as he noticed the state of the kid's skin. Maybe it was the heat, the harsh climate for the past two years, but the boy's flesh was dry and flaky. Goon then absently scratched at a patch of rough skin, revealing a new layer beneath it, which was green, and Juritan nearly shit himself. He had no idea what it meant, but it was weird, and he instinctively hated it. And the boy, completely oblivious to all of this, then finally answered his chieftain. I'm pleased with the efficiency, but not with how it's efficient. It feels wrong. Killing is killing, I suppose. The elements used to give me powers that made my foes just as dead, but I never felt this way about their powers. We're in this war because the ancestors told us we needed to kill the Draenei, so why is Gul'dan now saying we can't go talk to them? Something inside Juritan then snapped. He grabbed the young warlock's shirt and brought their face to within an inch of his own. It doesn't matter. I will do what is best for the Frostwolves. And now that means doing what Gul'dan and Black Ant tell us to do. You will obey this new order. Goon stared up at him with disbelief. Juritan's fury immediately turned to sorrow. I won't be able to protect you if you don't. <sighs> I understand, my chieftain. I will not bring dishonor upon the Frostwolf clan. The young warlock then stepped back, bowed, and departed leaving Juritan alone and conflicted. A single youth was not going to change the way things were unfolding. Not even a single chieftain could do that. The next target of the Horde was a sacred site. Fresh on the heels of the proclamation banning shamanism was the order to march on a place the Draenei called the Temple of Karabor. Although it lay within Shadowmoon Valley, the ancestral lands of Nazul's clan, no orc had ever seen it before. It was a sacred place, and as such, the orcs had always avoided it out of respect. But not anymore. Now, Blackhand stood before his assembled army and ranted against the so-called spirituality of the Draenei. The cities we've taken so far were mere practice. One day soon, their capital will be destroyed. But before we shatter their most important city, we will shatter them as a people. We will storm this site, smash their statues, slaughter their spiritual leaders. They will lose heart, and then claiming Shatrath will be as easy as killing a blind wolf pup. Juritan stood armed alongside all the other warriors, glanced over to Orgrim. As always, his friend was at Blackhand's side. He'd become a master at keeping his face impassive, but Juritan, once again, saw through it. They both knew what this meant. This was Velen's home. They may very well slay him this day, if he's in there. It was hard enough killing Restalan. Juritan would have prayed right there and then that he would not be the one forced to kill Velen too, but there was no one to pray to anymore. Six hours later, Juritan stood atop the stairs to the great seat of the temple, and he was almost choking on the smells in the air. The now familiar reek of Draenei blood, piss, poo, and fear. And then, it got too much for him and the Frostwolf Chieftain threw up. And as he wiped his mouth afterwards, harsh laughter greeted his ears. That's the spirit. That's all they deserve. I'll vomit and spit. Yeah, I'll vomit and spit. Mame kicked the corpse of a nearby priest and spat on it and Juritan tried to turn away in disgust, but there was nowhere to turn. Everywhere he looked, he could see orcs defiling corpses, looting them, pissing on them, etc. Is this what they'd become? Murderers? Thieves? People who pissed on corpses? They have taken the temple, but they have not found me my prize. Velen must have known somehow. He is called Prophet, after all. Yes, you are right. If he were easy and stupid prey, I would have found him a long time ago. At that, Gul'dan began to breathe again. It was always a little bit frightening when Kil'jaeden was in one of his moods. With their temple taken for our purposes, Great One, surely those that remain have all fled to the city. They will be there. He will be there, thinking himself safe, but he's trapped now. Indeed. The temple shall be yours, Gul'dan. Blackhand is already happily ensconced within the citadel. But before you order your little puppets to attack Shatrath, I have another little gift for them. Nazul watched Gul'dan beneath half-closed eyelids as the asshole wrote letter after letter. They must have been important letters. Normally, Gul'dan would have had somebody else do all of this work. The Shadow Council had relocated to the temple. The bodies had been removed, dark, ominous decorations had been put up, and the entire structure had been renamed the Black Temple. Now it played host to liars and traitors, and Nazul definitely included himself in that description. Eventually, Gul'dan finished writing, 
put his pen down and looked at his former master with thinly veiled disgust. Address them and take them to the couriers. Quickly. Lazul nodded his head. He wasn't going to bow. Not for shit. And Gul'dan, who either hadn't noticed the slight or just wasn't bothered by it, walked off. But Nazul, now alone, took this opportunity to read the letters Gul'dan had been writing. There was nothing contained within that Nazul did not already know, but that didn't stop the words from sickening him. He felt utterly impotent. Powerless. Or at least he did, right up until he noticed the unused pieces of parchment, inkwell and pen right there on the table. Kil'jaeden had taken Nazul's power away from him, but not his will. So, with trembling fingers, he took another piece of parchment and scribbled a brief message. Back to Juritan, who was getting increasingly fed up with the constant orders to march. They never got to just sit down anymore. It was just battle, repair armor, eat shit quality meat, and then back to battle again. So when this latest courier rode up, Juritan just kind of sighed and snatched the missive off them. But this particular missive was some next level bullshit. And Juritan was visibly sweating and trembling by the time he finished reading it. So he immediately hurried to Draka, who was the only person in the world he dared share this kind of information with. Who else knows of this? Only you. Will you tell Orgrim? No. I dare not. He's oath bound to tell Blackhand. Maybe Blackhand already knows about this. I have no idea who knows what. I only know that I must protect my people, and I will do so. Draka then looked at Joratan long and hard. If we, as an entire clan, do not do this thing, we will attract attention. You risk punishment, maybe even exile or death. Any one of those things is better than what will happen if we obey. I will not give my clan over to this. Draka's eyes then filled with tears, and she grabbed Joratan's arm. That is why I became your mate. I'm so proud of you. I too am proud that I can name Juritan and Draka as my parents. I am proud of their courage, but at the same time, I wish there had been more they could do. But I offer no judgment on any, save a handful of- Mate, just get on with it. You've been telling this story for three months now. Gul'dan was so excited he could barely contain himself. He'd been waiting for this, ever since Kil'jaeden had first spoken of it. The glorious being had delayed the giving of this new gift a little bit informing Gul'dan that timing is everything, and the same blow delivered too early or too late does not kill, only wounds. Which was an odd choice of metaphor, but probably nothing to worry about. But the day was now nearly upon them. Now, Gul'dan and Nazul stood in the courtyard of the Black Temple beside an empty pool, waiting in anticipation. But, for several hours, they just stood there in utter silence like complete lemons. For a moment, Gul'dan wondered if he'd done something to piss kill Jaden off, which caused him to start sweating a little bit. But then, as he glanced at Nazul, the thought that perhaps tonight would be the night that the defiant shaman would finally be slain popped into Gul'dan's head, and that cheered him up a bit. A sudden loud crack of thunder then made both Gul'dan and Nazul gasp aloud, and as they looked up, they saw a black emptiness in the sky. And then it cracked open, sending something bright and blazing plummeting down towards the earth, directly in front of them, knocking Gul'dan right on his ass. Behold, my lieutenant, Manoroth. On other worlds, they call him the Destructor. But here, he is the Saviour, Gul'dan. You know what I am offering your people. Yes, Gul'dan knew well what Kil'jaeden was offering. Power beyond imagining. Plus slavery for eternity. But Gul'dan did not give a single shit about the slavery part. He had no scruples. All he cared about was the power. I do know, Great One. I know and I accept my lord's most generous offer. Excellent. You are wiser than your predecessor. Gul'dan turned to Nazul to gloat, but the Elder Shaman just stared back at him, looking pretty much the opposite of impressed. Only this special blade can do what I ask of you, Gul'dan. It was forged in the fires of the mountain in the distance. My servants have worked long and hard to craft it. You know what to do, Manoroth. The creature nodded its huge head and then extended an arm, turning its hand upward to expose a soft, fleshy bit on its wrist. And for a split second, Gul'dan hesitated. What if this was a test? What if Kil'jaeden actually didn't want Gul'dan to do the thing he told him to do? What if Nazul had been right? Gul'dan, Manoroth is known for many things, but patience is not one of them. The giant beast then growled slightly. I am eager to see what will happen. Do it. So, Gul'dan swallowed hard, lifted the blade, and then stabbed Manoroth's fleshy wrist, and got sent flying backwards from the sheer force of Manoroth's bellow of pain. Liquid fire spouted from the wound, glowing a sickly green as it pumped into the empty pool. 
The injury was actually tiny compared to the vastness of the beast's body, like a pinprick, but the blood flowed steadily. Behold, the blood of the Destructor. It burns away all that will not serve you. It cleanses all thoughts of hesitation, confusion, or uncertainty. It creates a hunger that can be directed any way you choose. Your little puppet thinks he rules the Horde, but he is wrong. The Shadow Council think they rule the Horde, but they are wrong. It will soon be you, Gul'dan, who rules the Horde. The Orcs are ready. They thirst for what you will give them. Call them to you. As the now familiar horn sounded, summoning the Horde to the courtyard, Draka and Juratan rose without a word and began to dress. The Draka then glanced at Juratan and inhaled swiftly, as if something had startled her. What is it? Your skin. Juratan glanced down at his bare chest to see his skin was dry and flaky. And as he scratched at it, he saw the same green tint he'd seen on Goon's skin not so long ago. It's just the light. The Draka knew that was bullshit. She lifted her own arm and scratched, revealing she too was going green. What is happening to us? But Juratan had no answer, so he just continued getting dressed and ignored the question. Soon enough, the Frostwolf chieftain joined the amassed crowd of orcs within the courtyard of the Citadel. An announcement had been made the previous day about this assembly, but they hadn't mentioned the reason for it. Probably just chosen the Horde's next target or something. We have a long march ahead of us. Warriors, your weapons must be ready, and your armor sound. Healers, have your ointments, potions, and bandages at hand. But before we march to war, we will march to glory. Blackham pointed off to the distance, towards a sullen mountain. That is our first destination. We will stand on the mountain, and what happens there will be remembered for a thousand years. It will begin a time in which the orcs will know power that we have never before tasted. The crowd murmured, and Juratan tensed. So, today was the day. Well, that sucks. Upon arriving at the mountain, Juratan was surprised to see that it was not Blackhand who now addressed the crowd, but Gul'dan instead. It was not so long ago that we were a scattered people. We came together only twice a year, to sing and dance. But now look at us. We stand shoulder to shoulder, clan by clan all under the strong, insightful leadership provided by Blackhand. Let's give him a round of applause, shall we? The crowd cheered, yelling, For Blackhand! and stuff. However, Juritan and Draka did not participate. Under his shrewd guidance, and with the blessings of the beings who have chosen to ally with us, we have grown strong. We have grown proud. We have advanced further in skill and technology in the last two years than we have in the last two centuries. The threat that once loomed over us has been broken, and it will take only one final push to see it forever crushed. But first, we will pledge ourselves to this course and receive blessings in return. Gul'dan then held up a strange chalice. It looked to be carved from the horn of some alien creature or something. This is the Cup of Unity. This is the Chalice of Rebirth. I offer this to every leader of every clan. He, in turn, may offer it to anyone within his clan that he deems worthy. Who will come forth first? to pledge his loyalty and receive these blessings. Gul'dan immediately glanced at Blackhand, who was grinning like a smug idiot. But before the war chief could open his mouth to volunteer, another voice yelled out from the crowd. And Joratan thought to himself, No, not that guy. Never one to seize the moment, dear Gromash. Blackhand looked extremely pissed off, but Gul'dan went ahead and handed the cup filled with swirling green liquid to Hellscream. And Grom didn't hesitate. He brought the cup to his lips and drank deeply and then fell on his ass. Worried whispers rose from the crowd, and Juratan stared, horrified, as Gromash's body pulsated and quivered. The Warsong's shoulders then broadened, and his body grew, and then he got to his feet, taller than he'd ever been, more muscly than he'd ever been, and completely green-skinned. Gromash then threw his head back and shrieked, a cry louder than Joritan had ever heard before. It was absolutely terrifying. How do you feel, Gromash Hellscream? I feel... Magnificent! Give me dry flesh to tear and rip! Dry blood on my face! I will drink it down until I can hold no more! War songs, come forth! Not a one of you will be denied this ecstasy! The Warsong warriors then rushed forward, all eager to have what he was having. Each one shuddered for a moment in deep pain before transforming into a hulking green maniac. And Blackhand, who looked grumpier with each war song that received the blessing before him, then demanded that he drink next. And so he did. And then it was Maim and Ren's turn. Then his daughter Griselda stepped forward, only for Blackhand to turn to her and say, No, not you, bitch. It was ironic, really. 
Lacan's intent was to shame his daughter, but he'd unwittingly given her the greatest gift. Come, friend Orgrim, drink. My chieftain, I will not take that glory from you. I am your second, not chieftain. I do not wish to take your position from you. Juratan then sagged with relief. Thank God for that. The other clan chieftains then lined up, anxious for the blessing, but Juratan did not move, so Drek'thar leaned in. My chieftain, do you not wish the blessing? No, nor will I permit any of my clan to drink. But Juratan, it is obvious that this drink grants great power and passion. You'd be a fool not to drink it. I would be a fool if I did. Juratan thought back to the words Prophet Velen had once said. We chose not to sell our people into slavery, and for that we were exiled. History was repeating itself, but now it was Juratan who defied his leaders for the sake of his people. Perhaps he and his clan would also soon be called exiled ones. But that line of thought was then interrupted when Juratan realised every other chieftain had now drunk from the chalice. A crowd of orcs now stared in Juratan's direction expectantly. The moment he'd been dreading was now upon him. Mighty Juratan, hero of Telmore, come, drink your fill from the chalice. No, Gul'dan. I will not do so. Gul'dan's eye kind of twitched. You refuse. Do you think you are better than the others? Do you think you do not need the blessing? It is my choice. Perhaps others in your clan feel differently. Will you let them drink? No. I am the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan, and this is what I choose. Gul'dan then stepped down from his little pedestal and strode towards Juratan, and then leaned in and whispered in the chieftain's ear. What do you know? And how do you know it? I know enough, and you will never discover how I learned it. With that, Gul'dan pulled back and forced a smile. It is indeed your choice, Juratan, son of Garad. And if you choose to deny yourself such a blessing, then you must bear the consequences. The words were double-edged, but Juratan didn't care. He'd made his choice. Gul'dan then returned to his pedestal and addressed the rest of the crowd. All who deserve the blessing of the mighty Kil'jaeden have now received it. Think of this place as hallowed ground. Think of this mighty mountain as the throne of Kil'jaeden, where he sits and watches and blesses us. Gul'dan then looked to Blackhand as if to say, that's my part done, now make a speech or something. So Blackhand did. Tonight, we attack the last remaining stronghold of our enemy. We will tear limbs from bodies. We will bathe in blood. We will storm through the streets of their capital like their worst nightmare. Blood and thunder. Victory to the Horde. We have to abandon the city. Have it standing empty when the orcs descend. Then the lust that consumes the orcs will not even be sated temporarily. They will catch our scent and track us down. Those who flee will die. They must believe that they have slain most of us. And in order for them to believe that, it must be true. Velen stared at Lara here in horror. You would have me send my people to knowingly be slaughtered. All but a handful of us know what we fled on Argus. We remember it. We remember what Kil'jaeden did. We would, we will, happily die to preserve even a handful of our race uncorrupted. If the orcs believe they have slain us, Kil'jaeden will be satisfied. He will depart, and the orcs will suffer greatly. I know. They will, and I have no doubt that they will continue to track us down. But the methods they use to track a few dozen of us will be different than a few hundred. It is to our advantage to appear as scattered and helpless as possible. It is easy for you to speak so, but the decision is not yours, Larry here. It is mine. I must be the one to say you. You and your family will come with me and live. But you, and you, and you, you must stay behind and let demon-crazed orcs tear you to pieces. The army of orcs charged down the trail, burning with the desire to destroy anything and everything. Some of them even punched rocks as they passed them. Because why not? Fucking rocks. And during that charge, Juratan was more afraid of his own people than he was the prospect of whatever awaited them inside Shatrath. He was cold with sweat and shaken in his boots. But he wasn't afraid for his own safety. He was afraid of the future. What comes after this? Because it was highly unlikely that these new green twisted orcs were just going to chill out sipping Mai Tais once the Draenei were gone. The Orcish army continued to race forward, right up until they were about a mile outside the city. They'd been ordered to assemble in a clearing, but they'd been told that the Horde's war engines would be waiting for them, and they weren't. So for a moment, the entire army just kind of stood around looking really confused. But something then suddenly materialised in front of them out of thin air, something three times taller than the tallest ogre, crimson red with cloven hooves. 
and as Joritan observed it, he immediately recognised it as a gigantic Draenei. And it was in this moment that the Frostwolf Chieftain realised the Orcs had been plunged into a personal conflict that never had anything to do with them. You have nothing to fear and everything to celebrate. You, who have sworn your allegiance to me. I am Kil Jaden, the beautiful one, the one who has been with you since the beginning. And I am with you now, as you head to the most glorious battle yet. Once, the wicked Draenei plotted against you, hiding an entire city from your eyes. But you have destroyed that city, and others, and their stupid temple. All that remains is this one final battle, and then the threat will be eliminated. The green stone that once hid their city of Telmore from you, now hides their doom from them. Kiljaden then muttered those familiar hibbledy jibbity words, dispelling an illusion that had been shrouding dozens of catapults, battering rams, etc., as well as a whole bunch of ogres that looked very confused about where they'd just been. There is more. The Big Red Draenei then waved his hand, causing the warlocks within the army to suddenly cry out and grasp their heads for a moment. But that soon passed, and then they all looked extremely pleased with themselves. Some new spells. Use them well. Now, finish this. And that was that. The bloodthirsty orcs leapt into motion, pushing the siege weapons forward with a strength that Duritan had never before seen them display. But even before the machines were manoeuvred into position, the walls that protected Shatrath were under attack. Enormous green glowing rocks fell from the sky and slammed into and outside the city, with creatures rising from the craters that appeared to be made from the same strange green glowing stone. And it didn't take long at all for the combined might of orcs, ogres, war machines and infernals to bring the outer walls of the city down. The tide of crazed orcs then swarmed through the breach, but Juritan stayed where he was, outside the city watching as the orcs fought and killed and died. This was madness. There was no strategy, no attempt at defence. It was nothing more than murder and slaughter, dealing death and receiving it. In fact, some of the orcs were just blindly running into dead ends where traps had been laid like complete idiots. Dozens, if not hundreds of orcs would die this night, and the city itself would be rendered unlivable. Absolute madness. Meanwhile... They swarm like insects. Indeed, it's glorious. So, what's next? Next? There is no next. At least not here. The orcs have fulfilled their purpose. They burn with your blood, my friend. It will consume them eventually. Unless they have an outlet for it. And once the Draenei are gone, they won't have an outlet for it. Well, probably for the best that this is over. Our command mutters that you're wasting time. And our master wishes us elsewhere. Ah. <sighs> I suppose Sargeras has been very patient with me. Shame. I would have liked to have stuck around long enough to see them gut Velen. Ah oh well. Enough to know that it happened. Let us leave this place. And then, Kiljaden gestured, and both he and the Pit Lord disappeared. What do you mean he was not there? What I said. We scoured the city. Velen was nowhere to be found. Ugh. Perhaps an overeager grunt found him first, and mutilated the body? Possible. Even likely. But from what you told me, even if his body had been hacked to pieces, Velen could not have been mistaken for an ordinary Draenei. Gordan shook his head. He felt bloody sick. This was not good news. We scoured the city. I told you we did. Balls. Besotted though the orcs were by bloodlust, they would not have failed to search for Velen. Somehow, that bastard had managed to escape. Again. Which meant there were probably still other Draenei left out there. Somewhere. And that thought made Gul'dan panic even more. How many had he let slip through his fingers? Where the bloody hell were they? Velen sat clutching his favourite violet crystal with tears streaming down his face. He'd spoken with each of his people that he'd chosen to send to die, embraced them, and blessed them. He'd taken items that meant something to them and promised that those things would survive. And he'd watched as they'd marched off to enclose themselves behind a walled city and wait for slaughter. And then he'd watched as the city fell, and there was absolutely nothing he could do about it. The only good news was that the orcs did not know about the Zangamash. They had not yet sniffed out this hiding place, and if Velen had anything to say about it, they never would. Here, they could survive. Here they could regroup and recover, and pray that they had finally tricked Kiljaden the Deceiver. So despite everything basically being shit, Velen the Prophet still felt hope stirring inside him. Gul'dan was so terrified and desperate at this point that advice, any advice, from anyone seemed like a great idea. So he went ahead and turned to Nazul, who was the only other person in the room. What do I do? 
<laughs> it's not as if you're blameless in this. Of course not. I made choices for myself, but I never threw away the future of my people for it. Where is the power you were promised now, Gul'dan? The power you bartered our people for? Gul'dan turned away, trembling. There was no power. There's always right, the jerk. Rather than rewarding his loyal servant with glories and godhood, Kil'jaeden had just buggered off, leaving behind nothing but warlocks, demons, insane orcs, and a ravaged land. No, this can't be it, Gul'dan thought. There was still the Shadow Council. There was still Black Hand, the ideal puppet. And although the Horde was now infused with demon blood and were kind of mental, they were not completely beyond control. At least not yet. The land is dead. Orgrim stood beside Juritan, knowing his old friend was absolutely right. There was no grass anymore, no trees. Even the rivers had dried up. The only water that remained in the land was filthy, full of animal corpses and crap. To drink it was to risk illness, but to not drink it was to risk death. More than the land is dead. How was the Frostwolf grain supply? Several barrels were stolen in the attacks. Which clan? Shattered hand. Orgrim nodded. The orcs were indeed turning on each other, but the Frostwolf clan were bearing the brunt of the attacks. Juritan had basically put a big target on their heads when he'd refused to drink Gul'dan's green steroid goo. I will bring some the next time I see you. I will not take charity. Don't be proud, friend. If I were in your position, you'd beat me down near senseless and shove food down my throat. Juritan laughed for but a moment before remembering everything was shit now. Fine. For the sake of the children, I will accept it. The Frostwolf chieftain then returned his gaze to the surrounding wasteland and the citadel on the horizon. The ugly fortress had gained a much more fitting, darker name within recent years. Hellfire Citadel, with the entire area being renamed Hellfire Peninsula. So it didn't really make much sense calling it a jungle anymore. The orcs aren't going to last much longer, Orgrim. We're fighting each other, stealing food from the mouths of children out of desperation. Our casters can destroy and torment, but they cannot heal. Has anyone tried to work with the elements? Yeah, it didn't work. They were just met with stony silence. And demons guard our shagoon. We can find no hope there. Then, we are indeed finished. Orgrim then glanced down at his doom hammer and wondered if this was what the prophecy had foretold. He was the last of his line, after all, and he did kind of feel like he'd brought doom down upon his people. Back to Gul'dan, the asshole was in his room at the Black Temple, just about drifting off to sleep. And as he did, he dreamed, for the first time in a long time. But it didn't take long before Gul'dan realised that this was no dream. T'was a vision. Stood before him was a vaguely orc-shaped being clad in a long cloak, but a very slender being, even more so than a female orc. Yet Gul'dan immediately sensed that it was male, and that despite its small stature, he was extremely powerful. You are feeling adrift and alone. Gul'dan simply nodded. That's exactly how he was feeling. Kill Jaden promised you power, strength, godhood, things that your world has never even seen. He abandoned me, caused us to ruin our world and left us to die with it. If you come from him, then... Nay, I come from one even greater. I come from his master. His master. Gul'dan then fell on his ass as his mind was assaulted with images. Images of Kil'jaeden and Archimonde and Velen back on their homeworld. He saw their transformation and all the while he sensed a great presence behind it all. Sargeras. Yes, the one who rules over all. The one we serve. You will soon understand, Gul'dan. The destruction and oblivion are beautiful and pure. That is the direction in which all things must go. You can resist it and be destroyed, or aid it and be rewarded. Gul'dan was a little bit suspicious of these honeyed words after everything that had happened, but it was still tempting. What is being asked of me? Your people are dying. There is nothing in this world for them to destroy. There is nothing left for them to survive on. So they must go elsewhere. Somewhere with ample food and drink, and worthy prey to slaughter. Give them the blood they crave, Gul'dan. That sounds like a reward, not a task to which I am set. It is both, but it is not the only reward my master offers. You have tasted power. You are the greatest warlock that exists among your people. But imagine if you were a god. Ooh. Gul'dan liked the sound of that. We have a mutual foe. I would see them dead. You would see your people sated with slaughter and killing. This is a partnership that would benefit us both. Indeed. But... 
I do not for one second believe that this is all you ask of me. <laughs> Sargeras will give you all this and more, but he lies, imprisoned. His body is trapped in an ancient tomb on a world that's not your own. Bring your orcs into this verdant, unspoiled world. Defeat the denizens of this place, and join me in liberating our master. The view around Gul'dan then shifted, and he now found himself standing in a beautiful meadow, with beasts he'd never seen before grazing, and little pink beings as slender as the stranger, frolicking and being all like, tra la 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 It was perfect. And next, Gul'dan found himself underwater, swimming down but somehow able to breathe. Lurking in the darkness below, he could just about make out some very old foreboding ruins, and they were possibly the spookiest thing he'd ever seen. Release him from this prison. Tell me what to do. Ah! Gul'dan awoke suddenly. This wasn't where he'd fallen asleep. He then noticed a parchment lay beside him, covered in instructions and written in his own handwriting. And as he scanned it quickly, he saw some words. Portal, Azeroth, humans, and Medivh. And for the first time in years, Gul'dan smiled. The first thing Gul'dan did was summon his Shadow Council and share the words of the mysterious stranger who called himself Medivh. He told them about the beautiful meadow, the clean water, the delicious looking animals, and he spoke of the beings called humans and how they'd probably put up a good fight but then overall suck at PvP. Gul'dan knew he'd be able to sell them on this, and as he looked into their eyes, he saw hope and greed, which was exactly the sort of hope and greed he was looking for. And so the work began. Initially, Gul'dan had Blackhand send out decrees to all the clans. They were to submit their finest warriors for controlled one-on-one -on -one or small party fights in public display. The winners of which would receive food from the losing clan and pure water, as well as honour and fame and the glory of not being filthy casual noobs. That would redirect the attention of the Starving Horde and give the Orcs a bit of an outlet for their bloodlust for the time being. Meanwhile, instructions continued to arrive via visions from Medivh, and he was very clear about what needed to be done. A portal between two worlds. Medivh would use his magics to create one on his side, whilst the Shadow Council and the Warlocks would create one on Draenor. This was not something that could be done in secret though, because the portal needed to be massive. But that wasn't an issue. Constructing the platform and framework of this huge portal would give the Horde yet another thing to focus on. I don't understand why you're pissed off. Both Orgrim and Juratan stood and looked over the construction site of the Dark Portal. There were orcs everywhere, their green skin glistening with sweat underneath the sun that scorched the land. Is this not better than having them ride into your camp and slaughter your clansmen? Yeah, in a way. But we still don't know what this is a portal to. Does it matter? Look around, Joritam. We know what this is a portal from. <sighs> I suppose you're right. I've been meaning to ask. Why did you refuse the draft Gul'dan offered? Why did you? There was something... not right. I didn't like what I saw it doing to the others. Joritam then shrugged, hoping his friend would not press the point further. Then you had the same insight I did. Joritam didn't see any point in revealing what he knew. He'd managed to protect his people from the horrors of drinking demon blood. He'd asserted himself to Gul'dan, and so far, there'd been no repercussions for that, so there was no need to dwell on it. I fight today. Will you be there? I know you do this not for glory, but for your clan. You fight to win them food and water, but I will not show my face at these displays. Orcs should not be fighting orcs, not even in ritualized combat. You've not changed, Juritan. Still ever afraid of me defeating you? <laughs> You wish. Sometime later, with construction nearly complete on the Dark Portal, a ring of warlocks stood guard to make sure there were no curious onlooker witnesses to the process, while several stonemasons carved the final seal into the portal's base, and as soon as they finished it, they were straight up murdered. But even informed Gul'dan that the blood of those that created the seal would prime it, and Gul'dan had no reason to doubt his new ally's wisdom. The warlock then turned to his former mentor. You and your clan will be among those staying behind. Yeah, so I assumed. For a second, Gul'dan thought he caught a faint glimmer of something in Nizul's eyes, but figured it was probably nothing to worry about. At dawn, the army of orcs were ordered to make their way down the path that led from Hellfire Citadel to the portal, and their future. And as Juritan and his clan approached, the Frostwolf chieftain saw a Draenei child standing in front of the portal, which was a bit weird because nobody had seen a Draenei for months. What are they going to do with it? I fear the worst. The warlocks then began to chant, and to Juratan's amazement, Gul'dan appeared out of thin air and addressed the crowd. Today is a glorious day for the orcs. We have all seen this portal being built, admired the craftsmanship. Now I will reveal to you the visions I have had. 
Udan then pointed towards the dark portal. Far away, in a land called Azeroth, I have an ally. He offers us his land. It is green and lush. A race called humans. The enemy of our ally will try to stop us, but we will destroy them as we have destroyed the Draenei. The crowd cheered, but Draka shook her head in disbelief. How can they still feel this way? Can they not see this new land will suffer as ours has? I agree, but there's no choice, Draka. We need food, water. We must go through this portal. Draka sighed. She saw the logic, but she hated it. Even now, our ally is working to open the portal on his side. And so too will we. Gudan then gestured to the little Draenei captive. Blood is a pure offering to those who give us these vast powers. And the blood of a child is purer still. With the life fluid of our enemies, we will open the portal. Step into a glorious new world. A new page in the history of the Horde. Gudan then approached the bound child and raised his jeweled dagger. No! The word came rushing out of Joradhan's mouth before he could stop himself. As much as he had literally just said they needed to go through the portal, he knew deep down that nothing good could possibly come from something that required the sacrifice of an innocent child. However, before any major consequences could occur, a sudden horrific sound filled the air. The dark portal was now well and truly open. It was a black swirling mass, filled with stars, almost as if one were looking into a night sky gone mad. But the blackness then shimmered, and reformed itself into a scene that both startled and puzzled everyone. Gul'dan had promised a lush green world, but this definitely wasn't that. It was a misty, ugly, depressing swamp. Unhappy murmurs ran through the crowd. Didn't look much better than their own land, to be honest. But Gul'dan waved his arms for silence, desperately trying to hide the look of shock on his own face. This place does not look as inviting as I was. You! Gul'dan then pointed at two dozen fully armoured orcs at the front of the army. You! You've been chosen to be the first to investigate this new land. Go forth, in the name of the Horde. The group of orcs hesitated a little bit, but then did what they were told. But as soon as they had run through, the scene vanished. Gul'dan was now doing everything he possibly could to stay composed despite being extremely rattled. They will return with news of this world, I think. The image of the swamp then reappeared, and the orc scouts did indeed return. We have slain and eaten a number of creatures. Their flesh is wholesome and the water is pure. This land is bloody amazing, Gul'dan. The crowd murmured yet again, and despite everything that had just happened, even Juritan couldn't help but salivate. He hadn't eaten for two days. But Juritan then made direct eye contact with Gul'dan, and the warlock's eyes narrowed in a way that basically said, you and your clan are needed, otherwise I would order your execution right now, you bastard. Looked like Juritan's defense of the Draenei child would not be forgotten. Gul'dan then returned his gaze to the wider crowd of orcs and took a deep breath. This is the moment of destiny. On the other side, a new beginning awaits. A new enemy to slaughter. You can feel it, can you not? The bloodlust rising. Follow Blackhand. Listen to his orders. And you shall rule this new world as is your right. And with that, the army surged forward, entering this new world called Azeroth. The End. thundered through that portal like death incarnate, a torrent of blood-mad killers intent on slaughter. It's no wonder the humans hate us so much. But perhaps, perhaps this history I've chronicled will one day be read by humans, and elves, and dwarves, and perhaps they will then understand a little better that we too use suffering and victimization. That it? We done? Okay then. Not gonna lie, Thrall. That was probably one of the most depressing stories I've ever heard. Yeah, well, that's just the beginning. Doesn't exactly get any lighter, unfortunately. The Frostwolves were exiled shortly after arriving on Azeroth, with my parents being... My chieftain! What? What is it? There's news. From the Alliance. One of our spies has learned something he insists you must know. Show him in, then. And leave us. What's your news? My lord, the Draenei have come to Azeroth. Dren and I have been on Azeroth for years. We know about them. That's not news, friend. No. Actual Dren I. There was a ship. Crashed two nights ago. Proudmoor has agreed to aid them. And there is one among them. They call him Velen. Velen? 
Here. You mean to tell me that the worst enemy the orcs have ever known has come to Azeroth and been welcomed into the Alliance? Oh, fuck nuggets. 